Hi, Chet. I can't hear you. A soap opera with his other girls, and they were all trying to stay at Grandma's house. And she's not, her grandmother isn't on the approved list with the state. So they weren't going to be allowed to stay there. And wow. so they went and got a hotel that night. And so Kylie was highly upset. Well, right there, and so. it was funny. Yeah. So it started out, Megan was a little bit frustrated because she'd only got an hour of sleep. So I said, here, lay down. And I started doing massage on her, started doing hypnosis. And boom, she checked out, was gone. And I said, when family gets here, you'll be able to wake up and be energized. I got through and it wasn't five minutes later and her brother walks in and she pops up wide awake and never complained or anything the rest of the night. And then Kylie walks in highly upset. So I had her spin it and she calmed down. And then a little while later she was going off about something else and it changed. But the next day, after the funeral, or no, not the next day. Um, at, when we we're getting ready to leave on Sunday, I had her spin it again. Our grandmother's watching me, and I, then I had her breathe colors, and she was better because she likes to, when she's frustrated, get upset and angry and vent and yell. And I'm just, you're okay, everything's all right. And then I told her, hey, it's nothing more than point, make it a color, pull it out, spin it the opposite way, slam it back in. Or just breathe the color and you'll do better. So it was kind of fun. That's so fun that you were able to help your family like right there on the spot. And it's beautiful because you see immediate results. They feel the effects immediately too. So wonderful. Although when I try and do it to my daughter, she bites me on it. I don't like spinning. I just laugh. It's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. And I was trying to, I ran across somebody tonight that had just lost their son. And she was all upset. And I said, you want to play for two minutes? She's looking weird. And it's like, okay, I tried to get her spinning. She'd be there. And I said, close your eyes, look at your mind's eye. Well, I don't see any colors. So close your eyes and give it one. I don't see it. There isn't a color there. I finally said, so is it clear? No, it's not clear. It's just no color. And I thought, okay, you're going to fight me on this. Then I'm just going to change it up and do something else. So I switched over to her to breathe colors. I said, go with the first color that comes to mind. And she said, it's black. He's black. I said, okay. That's a color. And I'll feel that in my heart. Good. Well, so what's your favorite soothing color? She says, oh, bright blue. And I had her breathe it, and it went to a, it changed from black to a dark blue. And then she didn't want to do it anymore, but she started to smile. And so she was happier. And I went, hey, just playing. Yeah. Besides warranty work, I'm also a therapist. Well, it's funny when <laughs> they look at it. Warranty? I was there fixing their bed. Oh, warranty work. So I just said, yeah, my ADHD. I fix TVs, I fix beds, I sell solar, I sell security, and I'm a clinical master hypnotherapist, and I do EFT and Reiki. And she's like, oh, I said, I'm scattered all over because of the ADHD, but I have fun. I can't just do any one thing. Very good, very so. good. That's awesome. Yeah, that's interesting, you know, that, you know, some people do have that, that, uh, uh, you know, that urge to fight, resist, contradict you know all the time and, and then sometimes family yeah. members don't you know because it's a family member they want to fight you on it or they just they just don't want to deal with it or they just don't really think that there's going to be any benefit to them and so they they want to resist it's like okay well you know if you want to argue for your limitations you want to continue on your train of pain <laughs> you have free will <laughs> And if you decide that at any point in time, you're kind of sick and tired of the train of pain. But you see how it's funny because the more you do this work, the more you do see that some people are, you know, that whatever that pain or that issue is, 
it's serving them somehow. It, they're getting a benefit. You know, either it's their excuse to miss work, it's their excuse to get help from other people or whatever. And so heaven forbid, you know, anything that's going to threaten losing that with that gone. So what am I, you know, I'd have to be responsible. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't want to be responsible. It's not my fault. I messed up. Yeah. I, so. yeah, I saw that the first time when I was in my thirties, I was doing, had the six week spiritual warfare and healing class that we were, that we were doing. And, and through my church and I'll never forget there was this gal who had um, she had diabetes and she mm -hmm. had two young boys and her diabetes was such where she had to what you know they have these little they're called subcutaneous pumps that you you can either put them subcutaneously either into your skin and your stomach or your thigh but it administers a bolus of in her case it was insulin right because if she needed mm -hmm. an insulin boost, then she would just self-administer it. And but it had a little computer chip, so it would tell her, you know, what a what dose of insulin she needed to have throughout the day. And if her blood sugar got too high or too low, then she could self-administer an extra dosage, right? So uh, she said she wanted to be cured of diabetes, and we had we had a, a kid who was born deaf who was healed at this thing. We had a lady with arthritis who had been suffering for arthritis for over 20 years since she had been divorced. She was, we saw a guy who had a three inch difference between one leg and the other. Literally, as we're like, wow. you know, doing this special like prayer healing session on him and there was 10 of us in a circle and he was on the floor and you could visibly see his feet started off where they were like far apart and you could see his feet as we're praying. And I don't know if he could feel it or not because, you know, his eyes are closed, but you could see his, his leg like growing, like right in front of our eyes. And so wow. when it was done, then he stood up and sure enough, he was like, even I'm like, Oh hmm. my gosh, I just saw this like right before my eyes. This is crazy. So when this gal Kim went up, to go to be the subject, the Healy, I'll never forget. I could tell she, she was saying that she wanted to be healed. She was shaking like a leaf. She was petrified of losing her diabetes. And I could hear her say, oh my God, what am I gonna do without this? And I was like, kind of- Interesting. I was like, I was kind of confused because I'm like, well, why would you be here for the healing? Why wouldn't, why wouldn't you want to be healed? So as soon as she turned around and then, you know, you know, everybody starts off with their hands on their chest um, like this. And then you know, she turned around and then there was like a lead person that would um, lay her softly down on the ground. Right. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so we started, you know, doing our thing. And then of course she immediately passes out and I knew I'm like, she's not going to get healed. She's, she, she was fighting it. She didn't want to let it go. And sure enough, she was the only one who wasn't healed. She was the exception. And, <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, she doesn't want to be healed, even though she said she wanted to be healed. And I remember thinking about that for a long time. I go, there's a lot of people who really don't want to be healed. And no, they're just something out of being sick. Yeah, and, and I realized, like, and as I thought about it and kind of just pondered during my meditation time, I'm like, why would she not want to be healed? And so as I, it was revealed to me, it's like, well, her whole identity was di being a diabetic. And her, dia her condition of having, for her, she was diabetes. So because she was diabetes, that's how she got her husband to always take her calls at work. That's how she got her husband to, if the, if the boys were too much and she was overwhelmed, he would have to drop what he was doing at work and he'd have, he, could, he would rush home to help her because poor thing, she has diabetes. He would miss days from work because she's too tired or too whatever because of her diabetes. So she was getting a lot of payoff. She was getting a lot of, you know, she was being served where it's like he would jump hat whenever she said anything because she has diabetes. And if she were healed, well, why would he have to do any of that if she doesn't have that diabetes anymore? She would lose 
a great deal actually. And I realized that and I thought, oh my gosh, that's, but that just showed me. Sad. Yeah, it showed me that was really sad, you know, cause she's giving up, uh, you know, health, you know, for that. And, and I thought, you know, there's probably many people like that who, even though they have pain, they have discomfort, they don't have the illness on one side, but on another side, they're getting so much, they get so many people to go out of their way, donate things, donate time, donate services, do all sorts of things for them because poor so-and-so they have, you fill in the blank. And so they don't want to give the benefit, those perks, even though the perks of being healthy are better. They, right. It, it, they can't she didn't see it that way. Yeah, they can't reconcile, wow, having the freedom, having the power to do things on your own. And people will still do favors for healthy people, but in that person's mind, they're thinking, no, this is my, it's like, it's like their crutch. They need this. So it's an outward thing that everybody can see so that everybody's always, oh, poor. And I thought, wow, that was very sobering, confusing and sobering at the same time. And once I, I, you know, wrapped my brain and my heart around it. I was like, that's crazy. But it is what it is. Yeah. We can't override people's free will. That's, that's for real sure. It's not, you know. Well, we do that all the time. We just have to get them to look at it this way and realize, hey, if you look at it correctly, the benefits outweigh the you know, the problem, I guess. Oh yeah. But she was she was seeing diabetes as a benefit. Yeah, and I don't think she would have. I don't think her. she would have ever. I don't think she would have ever articulated that. You know, because we 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 all have our blind spots, and we have. Um, I think people have denial serves a purpose. Otherwise, you wouldn't have it. And anytime, anytime I see denial, especially in my family, my mother and I have conversations about this. And I'll say, denial is not just a river in Egypt, mom. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. It's like, you have to see the forest through the trees. It's like, you got to face, you know, the first step to being free from all this stuff is to be aware of it. Like Dr. D you know, Dr. David talks about it in the, um, especially the, the Chinese. Let me just send. Um, in the Chinese face reading class, he talks about how just shedding light, bringing into the awareness of the person, if you see um, whether it's, you know, a lifeline, purpose line, or uh, grief lines, you'll have sadness lines or sorrow lines, just calling it out into the light. It's like, hey, what happened? You know, maybe like, you know, on your ear, like I have on my ear, I'm hoping that at some point it'll go away because we did talk about it in class. It's like, hey, what happened between the ages of two and three? It's like, oh, this, this, and that happened. Sometimes that is enough for the line on the face to disappear, is calling it into the light. Now that the person who has the line is aware of it, and it's like, oh, yeah, it's like, this is what happened. You know, can I let that go? Yeah, I can let that go. And now that energy from wherever it is on your face or your head can now be released so it doesn't have to leave that mark there anymore. And that's what yeah because i had a grief line disappear oh did you class. was yeah. it during the class but it, well, yeah because it was rj that said oh yeah you've got this grief line here and i said i don't know what you're talking about take a picture of it and he went to take a picture and he said it's gone and i just kind of went oh okay wow. but i was working some of what i thought it was about and just releasing that on the way to class. That's amazing. So I went, oh, wow. And he brought it up to David. That's pretty Do cool. we have that face reading videos available yet? I don't even remember. I haven't seen a single video. I have to check um, with Stephanie. Um, uh, cause she said, I remember that she was going to send them to us. And she says, I remember her specifically telling me that she was going to send them to me. If she has sent them to me, mm -hmm. I haven't seen them. 
So I don't know if they're going to come in an email or if they have them in a separate place. I hope, I hope if they put them on his website that they have it in a separate place so that, you know, separate from whatever, like classes and stuff that you bought. Because I, I want to say it was Rob that uploaded the identity by design stuff without the music. And I just haven't gone back to pull it on the first four day. Rob upload? Well, I know, I, I remember seeing the first day of videos on the Identity by Design Facebook page. And I saw those, yeah. but my understanding was that, you know, TJ, he was video, he taped the whole, he filmed everything. And then my understanding is that right. we did all those videos, um, uh, you know, after the class, but I don't remember seeing anything. I mean, it would have, I was hoping to, as soon as we got back to watch all those videos and play them so that even like while I'm sleeping so that it would re-trigger and remind, not my subconscious mind, but my conscious mind, because I know he did a pretty good job of um, hypnotizing us, but it's still, it was a ton of content. And um, every now and then, like, I, know. I want to go back and review, watch the video again, because yeah. there were certain things the other day I was thinking, I don't even remember which techniques he taught. And somebody said something about pillar of power and I went, uh, I, I think I might. Yeah, the pillar of power. I love the pillar of power. I used, once I learned it, I used it a lot. Um, not just the, that we needed for the number of sessions, but I used it. I kind of started combining like multiple of the methods that he gave us to just like exponentialize the effects. Um, Cause I really love the pillar of power. The pillar of power is like when you have a pillar of, of power in a certain color and you have somebody steps into the pillar of power and once they're stepping into that energy, they're seeing, first they see above the clouds, you know, first you see above the mountains and you see all above your city and then you step into the next pillar of power and then now you're above all the clouds. And then when you step into the third pillar of power, now you are out in outer space, like beyond the Milky Way, where you could see the solar system, the sun, the moon. You see the Milky Way well below you, and everything is well. I hope this isn't an emergency. Do you mind if I put you on a quick? I'm going to put you Go on for it. Okay, sorry about that. That's my best friend. She's from Hawaii. And I, you know, when she called a minute ago, I just texted her back, you know, that I'll call you later. For her to call back is unusual. So I thought, oh my gosh, they just broke into her classroom and did all this damage at her school. And so I thought, uh oh, I hope something else didn't happen. So that's why I'm like, uh oh, I better pick up the phone just in case. But no, it's all, it's fine. So, um, so anyhow, that was the pillar of power so that you, whatever, whatever it is that you're trying to amplify and to, you know, um, increase the feeling of energy and power and good feelings and what have you, you're amplifying it exponentially because it's like three levels of power. So that's why you go where you see above the city, above the clouds, and then you're out of like beyond outer space where the galaxy, the Milky Way, it's all like below you and you're like way above in this incredible pillar of power. And then you come back from there and now you are empowered with this like big dynamic energy. Do you remember it now? A little bit because <laughs> you said, well, you're way up there and I'm going, how come I don't remember that? Well, because I was thinking it was a pillar that just kind of went around you 
you know, step into. Like, remember Star Trek? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what he, he even mentioned Star Trek, so you do remember some of it. Because you know how in Star Trek, they well, have those round circles and they step into the round circle and um, then you see the energy, it disintegrates them and then they beam to wherever. And he talked about the pillar of power is kind of like that. It's like this, this pillar of energy that you step into. So you, whatever it is that you're- But I'm only seeing it like maybe eight feet tall, like you're stepping into a cylinder and that's the pillar. Oh no, Not so the pillar, we, well in my mind's eye, it. it goes like infinitely up. So, um, and for, for some reason, I don't know why I picture my, when I see the pillar of power, I think of it as like this white quartz uh, pointed thing that goes like up very, very like infinitely high. And then you step into it and it's just supercharged with whatever power. And then you feel that incredible, but it's whatever, whatever goes into your imagination. You know, it, yours might be purple. Somebody else's might be pink or indigo or uh, or it could be multicolored. It doesn't really matter. So, but the point is that uh, you're stepping that's into, you well, actually step it into it. it. Yeah. yeah. Without and, being and, able to go back and watch the videos. Yeah, so so that's why it would be, be to, it would be nice to oh. be able to watch the whole videos because then you could review all 14, especially from the regression technologies class, be able to review all 14 different methods. I mean, we kind of whizzed through all of them for the exam at the end. And we were obviously able to do all 14 of them. Well, I did 13 out of the 14. I totally, like the very first one, I wasn't even, not even halfway done. And then the two minutes were up and I'm like, what? I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I'm gonna totally, Love this it's like I didn't get to finish the first one and so then I had to like super speed it up and use anchoring to like you know expedite everything since we were basically already in trans so that you know you can get through the method um, quicker and then the second one through the 14th and I was fine but the first one I total I didn't I wish I could say I did all 14 well no I flunked the first one and um and then the, the, after that, that was like a big learning lesson. And I told, yeah, I think it was Seth. I told Seth, I'm like, I'm going to, I'm like, I totally munched this. I barely got out of the induction. And then the two minutes were up. And he's the one who told me just anchored. Da, da, da. I made that one adjustment and then I was home free. All right. But yeah. Well, I'm glad it was only one out of 13. Sometimes I feel like even the ones we learned before we had the whole sheet and he handed out and I went and looked and I don't know a few weeks ago I found the sheet and I went I don't remember that one I don't remember that one oh yeah I forgot about that one I forgot about this one I forgot about that one so you know one of the things I was thinking because I know it would be beneficial for me and I I, I kind of feel like you're, that's kind of the same thing that you're you're saying is the same thing that I've been thinking and feeling is that it would be nice to take like one method a week or even two methods a week. And it's like, okay, we can do maybe 45 minutes of the Chinese face reading, read about it, do a little practice with it, and then maybe try one or two of the methods, just review, okay, these are the first two he taught, then the next two, and then the next two. And that way, that way we get a review, it kind of refreshes our memory, and we're like, oh yeah, totally forgot about that method. Let's try, you know, as you remember those different methods, um, I'm sure your subconscious will bring them up to you, the ones, um, the ones that you really inherently need to need, at, you know, to use at whatever time you're, you have somebody in front of you. But I think it's a nice review because then it just makes you feel, um, I don't know, it just make, would make me feel more competent knowing that, because um, they weren't, they weren't that difficult to do while we were in class, you know, like even some of yeah. them, he would explain them. And you're like, okay, well, let's see how this works. And then you did them and it's like, oh, okay, I got it now. Now that we actually did them and so forth, anything that was like, I'm not really sure what he meant by this. And then, you know, we all figured it out once we broke out and we started doing, you know, the actual practice on, on people, we were, we were cool. So I think, I think that would just be, I think it's always necessary to do a, a review and a, a reapplication of what you learned so that you're, um, you know, you just feel more comfortable and like you have your arms more around it so that your tools are more 
in your mind's eye, you kind of see them more clearly. You're like, hey, you know what? I, I, what if I use this and this together in this particular case? I kind of feel like this is going to work really well. And then you just go from there. So we can do that if you want. I'll, I'll mention it to, and we can do it today too. We can read a little bit of the book, do a little bit of face reading. And, um, and then- Well, that's funny too, because I've got the PDF and I come in on this computer and I, what happened to my PDF? And I swear I had oh, the PDF on this Oh, you can't find it now? One. No, I can't find my Lillian Bridges. So if you go, do you have a Mac or do you have a PC? Uh, both, but I'm on the PC right now. You're on a PC? So on a PC, mm -hmm. well, you can do a search on your PC just as you can on a Mac. I'm on a Mac. I'm doing a, that's what I'm doing right now for face. And I still haven't found it. You can't find Hope it? That, yeah, I got to see if I can. I thought I did. And then it's like, why is it in... Oh, that's why is that a system command? Is there somebody? Well, it's weird. It's like it's gone. It, can't it was gone. in my downloads, I thought. Yeah, it has to be. Or look in your recents folder. Because in your recents folder, it might you might find it more readily in there too. No. So, give me a give me a moment. I'm gonna put this in flash drive in the Mac, and then I'll get it because I know it's in there. Let me see. I think I unplugged. I don't see. I'm laughing because I don't remember. I thought it was on this computer that I sent it to everybody. Yeah, you did. Because I, yeah, I thought it was called. Did, didn't you send yeah, it? you might need to send it back. Yeah, didn't you send it through um, WhatsApp though? I thought you sent it through WhatsApp, uh, yeah. or maybe you didn't. Maybe you sent it through through here through Zoom. I could send it to you. Well, yeah, it might have been. It would have might have been a Zoom call, but it's these two. See, I'm looking under else. There we go. PDF document. Let me see. Um, That's interesting with power and it's not. Okay, now it is there. Now you found it? I did, but the weird one is it won't. I thought I just copied it. It's acting weird. It's not opening on your computer? No, I found it on the MacBook and was trying to put it. There it is. Okay, copied it over there. And there, ejected it. Now. I can also do a share screen. So 
So you can just see it um, from my well, computer. Well, it was just cool. easier. Hang on a moment. Let's try to read it and then I'll copy it over into my downloads. Might still leave it on the PDF. Yeah, because I can see it now. On your computer? What's funny, it says, hey, you've already got that. It's okay. telling you, your computer's telling you that you already have it? Yeah. In the, in the correct folder. But yet. But it's not wanting to pull up? Let me do it as type. That's the wild one because it's it's called. Let me go back into that. Yeah, it's called Lillian Bridges Face Reading in Chinese Medicine. Yeah. And I went to copy it over and it says it already exists. And so I go into that folder, and you'd think, look, let me go to the L's. This is what I um. I just copied the title that's appearing. So that you have it. Face reading in Chinese medicine. That's the actual from the top of the PDF. That's how it shows. So if you just copy and paste that, search in your computer, because I didn't change the, the title at all, that's what appears. Well, I just said, we'll do a search in downloads for Lillian. Yeah, or if you just do Lillian. And it's not Lillian, there. Just, okay. Yeah. It should come up on your um, nothing for Bridget. See, and I do. If you do a little, just L I L L I A N, then or yeah, the and I did a search for face. Yeah, the other thing you can this do is, is so if you weird. do if you do asterisk period asterisk and then PDF. The asterisk period asterisk is the wild card. So any title that's a PDF on your computer will show up. So I just put that in the chat also. Cool. See how you have asterisk dot asterisk, and then PDF? Well, I just, I just grouped them all together. So I'm looking at every PDF there. And, and it's not showing? It's not there. That's the weird one. Yeah, yet when I said, OK, we'll copy it in that folder, it says, it already exists. Do you want to copy it? I was like, yeah, no. Or maybe you want to copy it to the desktop instead so that it's not I mean, it makes sense to have it in the downloads folder. I just copied it in, into my documents. Or in your documents folder, yeah. So I'm, I'm good. I've got it now. So what page are we on? We are on page. Great question. Let me go back to the book. Share. Um, didn't we go through this page? I can't remember if you were with us or not when we went through this page, um, page 68, where we talked about how, because the right side and the left side of the man, they're reversed. They're exactly the same, but on the opposite sides of each other. But mm -hmm. the center, the numbers that are here in the middle, these are all, um, they're the same for a man or a woman. And from 28 to 48, these are uh, basically your back. So this is like 28 is your head. This is your top, middle, lower back. And I think 48. So what page are you on now? This is uh, 68, I think. Yeah, 68. See, and I was just there when I go to 62, or five, six. Okay, I'm on 68 there now. Yours looks the same as mine. Okay. So. At first I couldn't find where I was at, but I finally did. Yeah, so page 68. Yeah, because I noticed the pages are different on the, 
paperback book as opposed to like I have mm -hmm. a Kindle version of the book. And now is it a different Kindle here too? I'm sorry? And you just jumped. I said, is it different in the Kindle book as far as the pages versus the actual book? Yeah. And I've wondered, do I get that or not? Yeah, I mean, I like having the Kindle. Because, but I don't know. Because you can find things easy, and um, you also have the the voice version. Um, but the pages are different on the Kindle than than the PDF. No question about it. Um, let me see if I, yeah. can, if I can find this one. This is figure 2-6. And the the one you said you were watching some show that had Lillian on it on YouTube. Yeah, that would I'll, be fun I'll send you. Well. I will send you. Um, yeah. I, in fact, I watched it last night, and then when I was driving to my appointments today, I was listening to it as a recap because it was so her explanation mm -hmm. of what she. It's funny because where we're at right here, it talks about that central corridor and, and how. The line, you know how Dr. David talked about a deep furrowed line that goes across the bridge of the nose indicates an issue with the spleen. So she goes into more depth and more detail as to all the different ramifications of that and how changing, it's telling you, depending on the color and the depth of the, of the line, it's telling you that you need to change something immediately in your diet. Whether it's there wow. or if it's under your, across your fulcrum, you know, that um, for nurturing line under your nose or that retirement line at your chin, mm -hmm. it all has to do with food, but it's not the way we think of it in terms of food because you might be thinking, oh, I need to eat more green leafy vegetables or I need to eat more, you know, fruits or this or not that. And um, that's not necessarily true. You might be craving toast with Irish butter, for example because your, your spleen might inherently oh, wow. need more fat because it doesn't have enough fat to do what it needs to do. So if you pay attention and give in to that desire to have Irish butter over toast, then you'll see that that line will dissipate. And so she's talked about, because she's had lines on her face that, um, that have disappeared and some of them have come back. Like she has the one, like during that, that video with Pacific College that I saw last night, the one on her chin has come back. She goes, that's usually a, a, a line that shows up when you're over 60. And so she said she had it before and now it's back again. So she's adjusting things in her diet. And so like she talked about toast with Irish butter. And one day she, she normally wouldn't eat just regular carrots, but she really had an overwhelming desire to eat carrots and then the line diminished so i thought i, I will put the link in mm. our thing here so you can listen to it but i thought it was nice to just have her concentrate on that central meridian line and talk about those three lines and what the different colors you know white red purple grayish blue um what that means and um how that plays out and how she's been able to confirm it with her people and and in that broadcast, she was specifically talking to acupuncturists who are practitioners who are attending that lecture through Pacific College. So she kept on talking about needling because they're actually doing acupuncture, you know, on the different things. And she was saying, you have to be careful not to needle too many things at the same time on the face because there are repercussions to um, how a person can react and then I was very surprised. She said, not only are you kind of poking the bear and creating this uprise of trauma by having too many needles in the face, but that if you haven't protected yourself before you do that, then it can, that energy can get on you. And now you're in the midst of having that same crisis because you haven't taken the ne necessary precautions. And I thought, wow, that's, wow. I go, that's interesting. Makes sense, uh, you know, from a, not only a spiritual perspective, but also from an energy perspective. I always, um, I don't know if you and I have talked about the energy of a Merkaban. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I usually do a, 
I do this energy thing before I go to sleep at night. I try to do it in the morning and at night, but usually definitely at night. Whoops, where I, I'll do stop screen share. I do a, I do a visualization of, I, um, do you know what a Merkaba is, first of all? Mm. Mer okay. I haven't heard of you. A Merkaba or Merkaba, it's a, um, you probably are familiar with the Star of David. Um, the sign of Solomon is mm -hmm. uh, basically it's the shape of a pyramid. I should have one. Actually, this is actually going to be helpful. If you can, I only have one of these. I don't have two, and I actually don't have. You after we get off here, you can we can go online and you can see what a Merkaba looks like. But basically, a Merkaba it's kind of like this pyramid. And you see how it has one, two, mm -hmm. three, four sides. So on the bottom, it's a square. So just picture a pyramid like this and one like this. So you have, um, I think it's 12 points. If you count all the points, top to bottom, there's 12 points. So when you, when you see a Merkaba, you are going to be, I always have my Merkaba is always going the top. I have it spinning this way. And then the bottom one, I have it spinning the opposite direction. Instinctively, I know that for me, that's right. I don't know how other people do theirs. I just know that my Merkaba, the top spins this way. So I, and I do it neurosomatically. So as I visualize it, I start with it being um, the top one, I spin it this way. And then the bottom one, I spin it in the opposite direction this way. And then I expand it out to cover my home. It covers my entire property. So my whole property, my kids, myself, my whole property has the protection of that Merkaba. So basically what that does is that any kind of if anybody has any kind of ill will, if somebody is trying to, you know, whether it's by ignorance or with malice, trying to inflict any either pain or harm, it's just going to bounce off of me. They're not going to understand why, because intellectually, everything that they're trying to do should be able to harm me, but it's not going to work because there's basically an energetic field that I have put in place and I put so that it's spinning infinitely. So it's impossible for that to dissolve. And I just, I probably don't even have to do it every day, but it's part of my practice. So I just, I used to do it just over myself and over my bed. So I would sleep soundly. And now I expand it out where it covers my whole property. And um, I've, since I started doing that, I've learned a whole lot more with other kind of esoteric teachings. There's a whole lot more benefit that, than I realized, but you can, it's a Kabbalistic, like, I don't know if you're familiar with Kabbalah, which is uh, Jewish mysticism, which is esoteric Christianity. Like, if you look at, G like, Jesus practiced this stuff. A lot of people don't realize that Jesus was an Essene, which is, uh, do you know what an Essene is also? Have you heard? Okay. So oh, this but is you're going to tell me. <laughs> So there is a small little group of, of, of Jews that practice the Essene principles. They're still, we still have Essenes today, but it, they're very hidden, very not, not much talked about. But the Essenes were the Jews that weren't necessarily caught up with the legalistic things of, um, of you know, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Everything was about laws and their man-made laws as opposed to the laws of the universe and truly what, you know, the infinite intelligence that we call God, uh, you know, really what the intention was that you could see throughout nature and you could see throughout the cosmos, which is how energy and everything is forming created at every level. And so they were very connected to the earth. You know, mm -hmm. um, they were not only connected to the earth, you know, we, we, in our Western world, we think connected to the earth, we think of, of the American Indians, right? And we think also of like Indian ducks, like from India, how they're connected with the earth. But it's kind of a bigger, more complete, as opposed to, you know, I want to say holistic, but people have paradigms about holistic medicine too. So I'm careful with my words. So basically the Essenes, they were very mindful, uh, you know, like with Judaism. I don't want to knock Judaism because I'm part Jewish, but I don't really believe on all, there's, there's a, there's a distortion, just like every religion. I think every religion has its distortion. You know, I've, I've got Catholics in my background. I have Jews in my background. I have Presbyterians in my back. My dad's a pres an ordained Presbyterian minister, you know, so I have this like really rich 
background culturally and spiritually speaking. But, um, you know, what you see is that, you know, there's the truth and then there's man's quest for control over the masses. And then you get a distortion of the truth. And now it doesn't become about really your connection with God and the truth. It becomes about really controlling. It's about controlling the masses, not letting them know the true secrets, because if they know the true secrets, they'll know their true divine power. They'll know their sovereignty and no one will be able to control them, which the truth is no one really can control us, you know? And so the bottom line is um, Jesus was a purist in that sense where he just dedicated himself to these teachings. And he really, that's why he didn't care what the Pharisees and the Sadducees would say. And all these legalistic BS laws, which really weren't truth, they were a distortion of the truth, right? And so he was letting people know, it's like, yeah, the multiplying of the wine, you could do this too. You know, having the blind see, having the lame walk, having the dead rise from the dead, having whatever sick people, whether they were lepers or whether they were, didn't matter what their issue was. He goes, as long as you're one with God and God is one with you and you know that, you're not rejecting that, then not only can you do these things, but you can do even greater things than I, because there's no, there. it's like, who am I? To blaspheme God and say he can't do something. If he created the birds, the trees, everything that we see around us, if he created me, he created the cosmos, for me to even doubt that God can do that, that really is blasphemy, you know? Not just saying God's name in vain. It's a greater blasphemy to not believe that the great I am can't do something. And the great I am is telling us that, yeah, not only do I do all these things, but I do it through you. And for you to think that you can't, how dare you think that you can't? And so, but of course the Sadducees and the Pharisees knew this truth, but they didn't want people to know that because they wanted to keep the people, you know, and it's not just the Sadducees and the Pharisees. I mean, all major religions are like that right now. Unfortunately, there's probably very few exceptions, but, but so, so if you look into a little bit of the Essenes and it's hard to find information out. When I first started looking into the information, on the Essenes and their teachings and how it's about, you know, being mindful and being in a spirit of gratitude and appreciation, whatever it is that you ingest, which is from the earth. Of course, we didn't have processed foods 2000 years ago, but you know, now we do. So it's, it's, um, it's a more whole complete way of viewing life, living and integrating these greater truths. And so that you really understand how energy, because it's all about energy because God is energy, right? So understanding how we can lift the natural laws on the 3D plane so that in the 5D plane, because the place where you meet God is in your heart and in your, in your mind, how we can lift the 3D laws of nature so that the supernatural can take place. But the only ones that can do that are human beings. Animals can't do that. Animals are not given that, that, uh, that gift. Only man has that gift, but most of man doesn't think that they can. And because they think that they can, they're in doing so, they're obviously blaspheming God. And that's why they can't do a lot of the stuff. Um, part of what we're learning, you know, with Dr. David is a lot of these teachings that if you go really back to a lot of their ancient, you know, their, their core truths and roots, they all come from, from these different esoteric teachings which the Essenes had it, the Taoists definitely, you know, had it, the Buddhists have it, the Hindus have it. They had all this information that was coming out at the same time, but it was, you know, there are people scattered all over the earth. So it had to be done in the language and taking into account the culture of the people, you know, wherever they're located. And so now here we are as Westerners, thousands of years later, and we're like, oh, yeah, there's truth here. There's truth here. And it's like, wait a minute. A lot of this stuff is called different things, but it's the same thing. Like uh, in Taoism and in Buddhism and in the martial arts, they talk about chi energy and ancient uh, energy medicine. You know, Dr. David has a degree in, you know, Asian medicine, right? And they talk about the chi mm -hmm. energy. You have the yin and the yang. Well, physicists talk about chi energy, except they don't call it chi energy. They call it psychotronic energy. You know, that's like, I don't know how I would say chi energy or psychotronic energy, you know, 
that's English and Chinese. I don't know how you would say it in German, but um, you know, if somebody decides to give, say it in a German name, that doesn't mean that it's a different thing. That's just how you say it in German as opposed to English, as opposed to Chinese. So it's just a matter of recognizing that the labels are the same, the practice is the same, and the effects are the same. Does that make sense? Yeah. So anyhow. Interesting. Yeah. So I'll, I'll send you her, her thing. And then I don't know if this video is still, I, as you probably, you may have seen, I interviewed, oh no, wait a minute, that's from my other group. I, yeah, because I interviewed um, the host of Red Pill Unplugged, Far Out with Faust. He had Dr. Elizabeth Chan. This lady's a, another brain. She graduated from MIT. She has all these different medical degrees and a physicist and a grandmaster um, a Qigong master. She studied with uh, Montak Chia. I really want to go to one of his events too. Anyhow, um, and, and um, so she was talking about you know, how you can move chi. And when she went to Montak Chia, she went to study at the Chiang Mai with Montak Chia. For seven days, they did this, they call it a dark room technology meditation, where from the moment you walk in until you leave, you're in complete darkness the entire time. And the whole objective of mm. that, that type of meditation was or is to increase your dimethyltryptophane levels, which are produced obviously in the pineal gland. Dr. Joe Dispenza also talked about this. And by doing that, you obviously, she didn't talk about the growing your transducer on your pineal gland, but from my studies with Dr. Joe, as you continue to do meditation, breathing a certain way, focusing your energy and attention in a certain way, you open up your pineal gland and then you have a chemical reaction uh, that ensues. You have like vasopressin, benzodiazepine, dimethyltryptophane, which is known as the most powerful hallucinogenic on planet Earth that is naturally made in the body, but people, I guess people buy also like man-made forms of DMT. But what happens when it's naturally created in the body, it grows a little transducer, which is a tiny little, uh, it's like a little antenna at the top of your, you know, your pineal gland looks like this little pine cone. That's why I have this looks like a pine cone and at the top of your little pineal gland it's like you have like a tiny little transducer antenna that sticks up it starts to grow once the dmt gets to a certain level and then once that's fully grown then that's where you have mystical experiences that's where you can start to you can see through walls you can um you can do like remote viewing you can um with your eyes closed you can put your hands on a paper, you could read the paper without having your eyes open. You know certain things um, about certain people. You can tune into other people's consciousness, you know, across the country, across the world. You can be in a different, I don't want to call it bilocating, but your consciousness is not here. So you are in a different room. Maybe you've never been in that room before, and you'll be able to look around the room, and whoever's in that other room can confirm, yeah. There's a red chair here, and yeah, there is a whiteboard there. And yes, there's a, a red bone on the top left-hand corner of that desk that's not plugged in because it's an antique. And it's like, how would you know that? But that's because you're actually, you're using your consciousness. Hey. You know, all this kind of um, fascinating, interesting stuff, which we can use for the same energy that we're using for healing, we can use it to manifest anything and everything. So it's, you know, it's all, it's all the same thing because it's all creating. Anyhow. So that's what that whole Merkaba thing, I kind of feel like we're going down this rabbit hole. <laughs> it's okay. I looked up Merkaba and it looks like it's two pyramids yeah. that are melded into one. Yeah. And so when you were telling me about it, it didn't make sense. Yeah, so like if you look at this pyramid, but it's but a it four-sided. It like yeah, it's a four-sided pyramid. So you have front, you have back, and you have the left, and you have the right. And so when you're picturing it in your mind's eye, you picture the the pyramid. Is kind of cool. My hand's not big enough for it to turn around, but you picture it rotating this way. The bottom part of the Merkaba is also rotating, 
I have my top go to the right and my bottom goes to the left. I'll have to remember some at some point to look up if that's significant or if it means anything because everything supposedly means something. It's never occurred to me till right now to look up to see what that means. And, and you know, that's individual. I think it's, I'm sure there are people where they have the top and the bottom spin in the same direction, right or left, I don't know. But, um, but it has to do with sacred geometry. So like when you're doing meditations, you sometimes see um, geometrical patterns because the energy that we have flowing through us, if it's resonance energy, then you're healthy. And there's a certain frequency and a geometric pattern that's made when you're healthy as opposed to, and there's like a, like a DNA coding in that, as opposed to if you have dissonant energy, like if you have disease anywhere in your body, like let's say you have a bad kidney. So that means that instead of having that sacred geometrical pattern in that kidney, you don't have a sacred geometrical pattern. You have dissonance. So instead of having a nice geometrical pattern, you have, it's kind of like a blurby mess. So when you're doing healing, as you see that sacred geometrical pattern, you can take that pattern and you can move that onto a person's bad kidney. And then that kidney will rise to the frequency of that geometrical pattern and that geometrical pattern of energy will heal the kidney at a DNA level. So then that's when people, you know, have like an instant healing in that moment because the kidney then became entrained with that resonant frequency. That's what those packets of information, like when you first see them, like when I first saw them, I, I thought they were just pretty to look at. I didn't realize that there was more, uh, you know, until, I mean, finally I found out from Dr. Joe, it's like, oh, every time I tried to look at it more, the more you try to look at those things, they disappear. Because anytime you effort, they disappear. So you just have to just stay as the awareness. Don't try to look too closely, just stay there. Don't be afraid of it so that you can get beyond that first level so that you can see what, because other, there's other things that want to be revealed, but you can't get there unless you, you have to get out of your own way, which at first is difficult because you just want to see more, you know what I mean? So anyhow, um, yeah, do some research on the Merkab. I think you'll be, you know, uh, I think you'll be really interested, especially since you do Reiki energy healing and you're into the healing arts. Um, and you'll see sometimes that the Merkaba is, because since they try to sh depict it on a 2D plane, like on a flat, you know, like piece of paper or, you know, like the screen on your computer, sometimes they show it as a, it's like round and you'll see all these circles, one overlapping the other. And they also will depict that as the Merkaba. But the true Merkaba, it's like a pyramid, one up, you know, one up right side up and one upside down. That's what the actual, you know, and that's where the Star of David came from, you know, having all those points. Okay, are you ready to? Well, neat. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry? I said thank you for sharing that. You're welcome, you're welcome. Do you want to um, do you want to go ahead and start on page sixty eight of our book and uh, where the heck did it go? Sixty eight where it's talking about for most people the easiest critical transmit transitions. Yeah, let's to see. access uh, yeah, for the most people, the yeah, the easiest base proper yeah. form. Perfect, perfect. That's yeah, go ahead, start from there. Yeah. See, uh, from the forehead at age 19, 18 Western age, which is like, okay. I'm not sure why Westerners would be different really than Asians, but okay. Oh, he, Dr. David talked about this and Lillian talks about this. So for, uh, for us as Americans, when you're born, you're zero. Mm -hmm. And then you're like a day old, three months old, all the way till you're a year old. At 12 months old, you're a year old. For Chinese, mm -hmm. for Asians, you're a year old. Mm -hmm. At your first day that you were born, you're a year old. So you okay? But you go from one all the way up to two, where we go from zero to one. Exactly. So they never right. start at zero. They start 
you're one year old when you were born. So really when you're 12 months old, they consider you two years old, whereas we consider ourselves one year old. So you have to always add a year. That's why it says here, you add, like here it says 19, which is the Chinese, because it's right. a Chinese graphic. So for us, you take away a year, because we start at zero. So that's why it's 18 for Westerners, 19 for Asians. Okay. Yeah, because the adulthood markings begin just under the hairline and terminate at the chin by age 70. And that's what we were talking about the last time we got together. Yeah. Um, different spots in the face, what they mean. Both men and women have the same age positions down the central, central meridian, but on the ears, the markings on the side of the face are mirror reversed for the different sexes. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what we were talking about last time. Mm -hmm. Spend most of my time reading the central corridor energy on the face. This line divides the face from the yin and yang, which we'll discuss in the next chapter. It's also part of the Du Ren channels of the eight extraordinary meridians. Okay, didn't know there was eight, but all right. I guess, well, what I'm thinking is seven chakras, not meridians. Therefore, any markings across the central corridor or across the two meridians indicates events that are life-changing and energy-shifting. Stronger the line, the bigger the lesson or message about the change in energy. See chapter one for gym key markers at pages 40, 50, 60. Unfinished or parallel lines across the central meridian indicate lessons and progress that are incomplete. So then the next page, yeah, that's the markings, the age markings all the way down from 15 to 100. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so interesting. It is. So, so like uh, on this graph, you see the ages down the middle from 15 to 71, mm -hmm. actually to 100. Now, she says any markings across the face that are horizontal. So like sometimes you'll see someone with a line across the nose and what she talked about here across mm -hmm. the nose, at the bridge. Here you have someone who has, you know, the, the line that I was talking to you about the just the um, lost love across. So if you have it across the nose at the bridge, the tip under the nose, between the lips and the nose, a line across here or a line under the lips across the chin. That is something significant. That's what she's talking about here, that it indicates something that you need to really change in your life, the way that you are being and what you are eating. Your eating will increase the amount of gin that you have, the, the natural power and energy that you have. And so um, depending on whether you have inherent, like some people, like you have a big, strong jawbone, you have big hips, big ankles, big, big um, wrists. That means that you have a lot of life force um, energy and you have a lot of inherent jing. And then there's spiritual uh, jing as well, which isn't visible with, um, with those traits. Instead, she says you have to like touch a person's ear. If the person, if you touch the cartilage that attaches to the head and if that's really stiff, that means that the person has a lot of, um, like a very strong spirit. If it's soft, then that means they're physically strong, but spiritually they're, um, they're not as strong, they're weaker. So you could have somebody who- Yeah, and I always do this because I thought I had these floppy, sloppy ears and they're going, oh no, yours are really strong. I was like, okay. Yeah, so you have like that cartilage that's like that attaches right at the base of your ear and attaches to your head. If that is kind of like thicker and kind of um, like just harder, that means that your spirit is really strong. And so Lillian says, it's like, okay, I might see somebody that's very petite bone, but, um, or a, a guy that maybe he doesn't seem to have, you know, a big jawline, he doesn't have big thick ankles or big um, wrists or big hands. And then I, you know, ask permission to touch the cartilage at the base of the ear. And if you feel that that's really strong, it's like, oh, you don't want to mess with that because you don't want to cross that spirit. That spirit, it's almost like a, like, almost like a, like an infinite spirit thing. It's like, you don't, it's like whatever the physical body can't do, the spirit will just take over. So you don't want to cross people like that. It's like, oh, that's good to know. Um, okay. 
Go ahead, go yeah. ahead and keep reading then under where it says numbers indicate. Yeah, we just talked about sort of track one for the Western age. The corridor of energy shows when incidents, traumas are up or redirected, Jim and Key. How well someone has fared in adult life can be easily determined just by looking down the center of the face, evaluating the markings on each feature. Brother, I see heavy markings. I'm actually, whenever I see heavy markings, I'm actually pleased. It means this person has learned some valuable lessons and has changed because of what has been learned. If the lines are faint, they're probably just repeating a pattern without much consciousness. The stronger the markings, the more thoroughly someone is working out important issues and the healthier the person will be eventually. Hmm. Okay. Now, is this horizontal lines on anywhere? Do you think that's what she's talking about? Well, she said that there's not only here, but also in that video, she talks about horizontal lines again across the bridge of the nose. Anytime you have horizontal lines that go across the face, um, left to right, Mm -hmm. or right to left, that is significant. So for example, like when we were in our Chinese face reading class, Dr. Joe, not Dr. Joe, Dr. David talked about how, okay, you know, lines that are complete without interruption, you see a line straight across, that's like, okay, this person learned something in their late teens. You know, if they have another line that goes straight across here in their 20s, like, you know, in their 30s, 30s or so go across, there are lines that are all the way across without interruption means that okay they had significant life lessons and they learned the life lesson which is why the line is complete however it's very common to see people where like maybe you have a, a line all the way across the line all the way across and now you have the one you know at maybe at their 30s and it, there's maybe a break and then it picks up again maybe breaks again or not there might be several mm -hmm. breaks that means that whatever that life lesson was in their 30s you know, that lesson isn't complete yet. Um, so it wasn't a completed life lesson. It's a lesson that's still, it's still in queue. Because just because you're 40, 50 years old now, 60, 70, 80, just because you didn't learn it when you were in your 30s, you know, you're still alive. So it may have been something you experienced in your 30s, and now you're 40, 50, 60, 70, and now you're having a realization, oh, I remember when I felt this. I remember when I experienced such and such thing. Yeah, that's, I get it now. Guess what? That line now can either completely disappear or it can be a line that will go straight across your forehead because that life lesson is complete. Just the no. same, just the, same the, the line could be across your nose anyway. It could be across you know, your, your cheeks across your chin, but those are significant. And that's where I'm going because I never heard anything as far as a lust, love line on your nose. Yeah. He, he, um, I'm, wondering, yeah. I'm wondering if she's going to talk about it later. Cause this is kind of a big book. It's like 400, uh, 438 pages. I'm hoping that at some point we'll see something with regards to that. I remember him talking about it in class and, um, I thought, Oh, because the first uh, lost love lines that we talked about, he mentioned, you know, they were coming from the um, the inner part of the eye here. Right. So that was uh -huh. lost love. There's, you know, there's um, lines of joy. joy. There's lines of sadness. Uh -huh. If you have what looks like a tear, but going going in lines from the inner canthus, um going kind of down here that's like some sort of lost love something you may have loved horseback riding and now your parents moved to new york city you stop horseback riding because there's no place for you to go out horseback riding if you're living in manhattan and so that could be a lost love and you may have had sorrow and sadness because you lost your your love of horseback riding but now you're living in a big city you no longer can do it it's usually not a romantic love loss it's normally the loss of doing something that you loved to do. Um, See, and that makes more sense because sometimes I've been looking at that and I thought, why do they have love loss, but loving something you do yeah. versus a person? Yeah, it could be a person, but it's usually a place, a thing, or an activity is what, um, what she explained. 
she explained, and Dr. David talked about that too. It's usually, it can be a person, but it's usually not a person. It's the loss of a love that you had for doing an activity. Um, it could be a sport. It could be an artistic thing. It could have been, you, it could have been, you may have loved spending time with your grandfather and maybe you grew up doing a lot of things with your grandfather and then all of a sudden your grandfather passed and now your grandfather's no longer around and you used to pal around going to pay the bills with him, going, you know, doing all sorts of activities where maybe you fixed up a bunch of property with him because you were his little side helper. And, um, you know, maybe he was your pal where you ate lunch with him and, uh, you know, every day. And now all of a sudden he's gone. That's a lost love because he was your, he was your bud. You were his bud and now he's gone. So that is the loss of someone, but it's also the loss of all those activities and how you, because, you know, with your grandfather, you're like, you're like his everything, right? So he's like thinking you're his little champion. You're his little Superman. You know, one day you're going to grow up to be, you know, just like me. And now, now that person who is seeing you with such adoring eyes that you could never do anything wrong, as opposed to your parents, your parents are correcting you all the time. But with grandpa, you're like this perfect little partner. You're like his little mini me. And now all of a sudden he's gone. Yeah, you're going to suffer. That is a, you're going to suffer. That's a love loss because it was the things that you did with your grandfather, not just, um, you know, yeah, you loved your grandfather, but you loved the things that you did with him. You loved the way that you felt. You loved everything that was involving, you know, the person, the place, and the things that you did. All right. Okay. Um, well, what? Let's see. Bottom one is talks about each feature on the central meridian is approximately 10 years of time. The one of the easiest ways to read the face is to look at the age period as a whole. The forehead is the 20s, the eyebrows are the 30s, the nose is the 40s, the mouth is the 50s, the chin is the 60s, and the jaw is the 70s. Oh. So for any feature that is clean, even beautiful, and well marked, gives the potential for good luck. Um, went into the Chinese meant choices and opportunities during that decade. Oh my gosh. Okay. So this is really interesting. So the forehead is the twenties, the eyebrows and the eyes are the thirties. So twenties. Yeah. It's not even marked because it goes from 28 to 41. Yeah. On her. Because, yeah, she said eyebrows, 30s, eyes, 40s, uh, 50s are the, the mouth or the 50s, chin is the 60s. So, um, I don't know about you, but I feel like I need to get a mirror. <laughs> Give me a second, I'm going to get a mirror. <laughs> because I'm well, Well, can you click on it? What do you mean, click on it? Can you click on you and have it jump more full screen? I'm gonna, what do you say? You had it full screen. It's like, can you click on you and show you as full screen? Oh, yeah. Let me I kick can... this back. Like that? I have, I have it on gallery. I don't know. Is that full screen? Well, when you were screen sharing, it was doing something, but. Yeah, because um, I had the. What I was wondering the... about is if you clicked on you, let me see. If I click on me, yeah, I'm seeing me full screen. But I didn't know if it was one of those things I can zoom in enough to. It's not that good of a picture, unfortunately. Speaker view. Okay, so like, is that, I don't know. When I do, I put it on speaker view. So now when, when I talk, I'm, I'm taking up the whole screen. Now, if you talk, then you'll take up the whole screen. Yeah, and what I did was I just double clicked on me. And I'm, it said pin video and it's showing it. And if I come up and double click on you, then it only shows me you. 
Oh, okay. but, I, but what I was wondering is rather than you go get a mirror, if you could double click on you, but it's not that good of a picture to be able to zoom in and really see the lines. So yeah. the mirror works better. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm like. Um... <laughs> it's like nobody likes looking at their face for lines, you know what I mean? Especially as girls, it's like, ah, you know, I don't want to have any lines anywhere. <laughs> It's funny because I met a lady and I said, oh, you've got these great joy lines. And she goes, no, oh, my crow's feet? I said, no, Chinese face reading. And you've got these big lines. They must have been like this long. Oh, so he's super happy. Back here. And yeah, and even though she had the sadness as well, but she had some huge lines. And she's like, oh, yeah, my crow's feet. I'm this and that. And I said, Oh man, I wish I had those lines to have that much joy. And she just looked at me and then all of a sudden started to beam because now all of a sudden that line was saying it was a good thing and it made her happy to, to have me say, Oh, I wish I had them like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it the way you, yeah, it was just it's, funny, you know, funny cool. to see the reaction because you're more like, Oh no, I got crow's feet. I'm this and that. I'm ugly. And he's like, No. They show, uh, they show a lot about you and I've found it's real neat that, and I'm studying people I don't remember what hardly anything is but I can pick up the lines yeah, and I, I mean, really need to go like, back and yeah, look for through men them. and women you see um, like the purpose lines across their forehead and then if they have any kind of you know vertical lines you know that's you know the dark night of the soul where obviously they had a huge uh, yeah challenging. I've got them that go like mm -hmm. this especially yeah. in the in the morning yeah so that means that you went through a very dark difficult experience and you learned something from it which is why it left a marking and so it's like whoa that's like you know those are pretty you see those in quite a few people um and then you see also like i've noticed more people lately with um like hollows in their cheek which shows that they've had it shows two things it shows not only grief but it also shows that they have lung issues and so oftentimes people who have, um, who are chronic asthmatic sufferers, who have a lot of uh, pulmonary issues, COPD, asthma, bronchitis, bronchiolitis, all a combination of those different things, they oftentimes will have like um, shallow, um, like they have a picture of, of somebody in the book because I looked up, I looked it up. I remember when I first heard Dr. David talk about it and then I went through it. Lillian's book and I think they had a picture of a uh, an older lady and you could just see like it's almost like a carving in the cheek that almost looks similar to the shape of a lung and I thought oh my gosh and then as you see people out in public every now and then you'll see somebody with that and you're like damn it's so obvious um anyhow uh yeah it can be very telling um Let's see. Let's go back to the share screen so we can see what this text says. Because we're looking for stuff as we're. Yeah, so she's talking about. Okay, so we got the foreheads, the 20s, eyebrows, 30s, nose is the 40s, mouth, 50s, uh, chin. 60s jaws 70 that doesn't seem as clear jaws 70s any feature that is clean even beautiful and well marked gives the potential for good luck which to chinese meant choices and opportunities during the decade so i wonder what the what the opportunities it says any feature that is clean even beautiful and well marked gives the potential for good luck so i don't know about you and me but supposedly 50s and 60s i'm in my early 50s so i'm wondering i can't tell from her description there how by looking at someone's lips that you could tell that there would be good luck fortune da 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 you know what i mean do you get it i don't get it i don't get it now a lot of this it's like i'll learn something and then i look at somebody and went well I know these are purpose lines and these are joy lines and that's all I can remember. 
Yeah, purpose. Yeah. Hmm. And I, I can see features, but I don't remember what the features mean. Like, oh, watching the debates the other night, and Biden's eyes were Crit. real narrow, the rectangles. And he was talking, and it's almost like he was squinting, but that came across. And it was kind of interesting because both of them were looking and the eyes weren't darting back and forth. Like, oh, I'm making this up. I'm trying to remember it. Yeah. They were both so, pretty. But you, oh, yeah. Really I haven't been watching is. any, any oh. of the debates or anything, but I've seen some of the still shots of the different politicians and so forth. And it's like everything I need to know about them, it's, it's literally written all over their face. You could see so much. And some, and some of, um, sometimes you see incongruence, which I was kind of surprised, um, that male and female. And so I'm like, wow, it's like, it's just uncanny. And, you know, as you do more and more of the face reading, then you, you start remembering more, you know, not only of the lifelines, but also the, the joy, the sorrow lines, the lost love, the disempowerment lines, which actually a, a good number of the politicians I've seen have those disempowerment lines on their nose, which it's like, hmm, that's interesting that they have the disempowerment lines. Um, almost all of them have disappointment lines, which are the lines that are at the corner of their mouths. Some of them have it on both yeah. sides or they'll have it um, just on their private side. Um, that's another one that I've been seeing a lot. Yeah, because I keep seeing the little turn down right here, mm -hmm. and I can't remember what it was. Disappointment. And so that's anytime, disappointment. Like I have, if I'm, if I have, uh, like a resting face. I don't know. See how it's actually on this side. See how it kind of goes down. Yeah, but barely. But that's. So I've seen them in their cow. Well, you see, some of them are more, more marked. But I used to not have that. Like before, before my divorce, I didn't have it. Um, then during the latter part of my divorce, I started to get it more on one side than the other because I started having a couple friends point it out, and they're like, "Oh, that happened to me too. That'll go away after a few years." But it's like, yeah, my it's like the corners of your mouth instead of them having a tendency of just being neutral or up, mm -hmm. they tend to go a little bit more down, but I do have a disappointment line. And I think it's less pronounced now than it was during the face reading class, because during the face reading class, um, this is definitely more marked. Mm. So I like, I keep on doing okay. this a lot <laughs> in my private time. I'm trying to condition the muscle to go back up again. I'm like, because I don't want that to be, you know, you know, it's like you don't want that line there you know what i mean so um yeah but you'll see that men women most of the men have it on both sides um and some of the women have it um on just on one side yeah so i think it's like whoa that's very very prevalent i'm trying to think where is another um you don't really see you don't see the over nurturing i don't really see that very many in, on many of them um, I'm trying to think what are the other lines that I've seen a lot of manic lines. You see on a good number of these guys, you'll see yeah. manic lines where the, their, um, the lines, instead of just being the joy lines here, they'll go like beyond their eyebrows. You're like, Whoa, those guys are pretty manic. That means they're probably, you know, manic that, you know, they could even be bipolar. I don't know. Um, mm. Anyhow. Let's see, keep on share screening. Let's get back to the book. Okay, so. Oh, tell me about the dame. Oh, you want to know about the, the title dame? Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, I thought you asked me this in Vegas. You didn't hear the ex explanation when we were there, I guess. Okay, uh, Okay. first of all, it's a giant cosmic joke <laughs> because I never even knew that women could be knighted. I thought it was, I thought only men could be knighted. I thought it was, um, you know, something you don't really think about. I mean, at least I didn't. And um, other than when I was growing up, my dad used to always tell my brothers and I that we were blue bloods, which is 
kind of a funny, kind of a funny joke. But anyhow, so uh, back in 2013, I had two physicians. They happened to be knighted. One was a male, one was a female. One was a, both of these doctors have like, like they have physics degrees and they have MD degrees and they have like um, Western medical degrees, but they also have Asian medicine degrees and acupuncturists. It's like, you know, they're, they're like true healers, not just MDs. And so this uh, one doctor from the East Coast, unbeknownst to me, nominated me. And then this other doctor from, uh, from the West Coast here, uh, she nominated me. And I knew that she was knighted herself. She was a grand dame. And um, I know that the um, other doctor that he was knighted, but I never gave it a second thought. I just thought, wow, you know, what are the chances that I knew one person that was knighted? And I happened to know several people who were knighted. And so they were, or they were both knighted through the Order of St. John. I have another friend who, Doc, um, his name is um, Sir Bruno, Bruno Serrato, who he was knighted several years ago also in the Maltese Order. And he's a fellow Italian. He was actually born in Italy. Um, you know, I, I wasn't born there. I was born here. So anyhow, so I knew several people who were knighted, but I never, never thought about that that was even a possibility. I just thought, I never even thought about it. It was just not something on my radar. So when all of a sudden these two people come to find out they nominated me. And then what I found out was from Dr. Rose, she said to me, Dr. Rose Michael, she goes, oh, by the way, you've been nominated to be knighted. And I said, what? And Dr. Sandra Rose Michael says, yes, Lillian, you've been nominated to be knighted in the order of St. John. And I thought to myself, mm. What? How is that even possible? I, that doesn't make, that's like me telling you right now, oh, by the way, Chad, um, you've been selected and nominated to be the next man on the moon. Does that make any sense? You're like, no. I'm like, um, <laughs> oh, you're nominated. You're it. We picked you. Okay. Yeah. So it's like, um, wait a minute. It's like, yeah, it's a nice fantasy and so forth, but it's like, I never really actually. You know, I've never taken uh, any classes to be an astronaut. Um, I'm just a, I'm just a regular person, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. it's not, you know, as a child, you may have dreamt of being an astronaut, but I didn't even ever dream of being knighted. So this was, this didn't make any sense to me. I'm like, well, how is this even possible? And she said, she didn't tell me, she didn't confess to me that she had um, nominated me. She just said, um, Her Excellency needs you to provide certain documentation because you've been knighted. There's been a couple of um, physicians from different parts of the country who nominated you. And, um, and I said, wow. I'm like, and if, if it wasn't her, I would have thought this is complete BS. But because I knew her, and I know, you know, I've seen her many times. She's at the White House for I don't know how many different, like, three or the last three or four different presidents you know she deals with a lot of royalty around the world she she's an amazing and incredible very accomplished um scientist physician etc so she said yeah you need to hand in certain paperwork and so forth but i thought wow i'm nominated to me that's like being nominated for an oscar i actually have that as a goal to be nominated for an oscar for one of my screenplays that to me that's within my reach so this was like, like, okay. So I thought nothing will, I figured that was it. Yeah, I'm gonna give whatever, whatever they're asking for, but I don't expect to, I thought, I thought that was it, that I wasn't gonna hear anything else. I thought just to be nominated to me, that's like hitting the lotto. Next thing I know, maybe I don't, I totally forgot about it after that, just thinking, wow, I was nominated. What an honor, what an honor. Next thing I hear, she said, oh, by the way, um, July 28th, 2013 at the Agape Center, you're going to be knighted. And that's the day of your investiture. You have to be there by five o'clock, blah, blah, blah. I said, what? I'm actually going to be knighted? She goes, yes, your investiture will be at, you know, at the Agape Center, da, da, da. She said, oh, by the way, here are your formal invitations. And, um, and these are the people that are going to be knighted with you 
that is where the cosmic joke went on steroids because the fact that I was being knighted is really not the big deal to me. When I saw on the list was Dr. Reverend Michael Beckwith, who is a, he's the leader of the Agape Center. He is the guy that you see him on Oprah all the time. He's on the secret, you know, the book, the DVD, and he's in the media all the time. He was being knighted with me, or I'm being knighted with him, however you want to look at it. Jack Canfield. Wow. Don Miguel Reese. You know, Jack Canfield, we know him from Chicken Soup for the Soul series, yada, 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 The Power of Focus, all the different books he's published. Also, he was also on The Secret. Then Don Miguel Reese, author of The Four Agreements, The Toltec Art of Wisdom, been a New York Times bestseller for the last 25 years. He's a cardio, cardiac surgeon who turned spiritual teacher. You know, so I'm going, I'm like, oh, Dr. Hyla Cass, um, Lisa Nichols. I can't remember. There's like maybe one or two other. There's a total of seven of us. And then, and then my name's on there. And I'm like, all these people, that makes sense for them to be knighted. I'm like, uh, what is my name doing there? I'm like, I don't understand. How is it that my name is with that group of people? So, and sure enough, the day came to pass. I went, I was knighted. Uh, we were at the, they, they had a dinner for us. Um, it was a very small, small, intimate group of people that were allowed, you know, for the dinner and, and the rest is history. So, and then of course, her, her, her Excellency Countess Bobrinskoy, she's the one who leads the Order of St. John. Um, so then shortly thereafter, she said, okay, I want you to come to, um, I want you to come to the UN. I want you to have lunch with me. I, there's several other people, you know, because the order has to do with, it's a, a thousand year order that was created. At, they were the first hospitalers. They were the first group of people. They were a group of wealthy people that put together hospitals so that the common man and woman would have medical care. And when they first put this together over a thousand years ago, their intention was to provide medical care for children. And then after children, it was women and children, and then it was for the common person. Once they took care of the kids and the women, then it was to have health care, which prior to that, only nobility had access to health care. So the intention was to set up hospitals all over Europe, throughout the United States, to provide health care. And so um, that's, how, that's how that whole thing happened. That's the whole story. Hmm. <laughs> so it's, like I said, right. it's, uh, it's a cosmic joke. It's God's grace because, like I said, I don't, I didn't, it was like out of the blue. It just came without me knowing about it or you know it just it just happened so okay well thank you for sharing that too yeah let's see how you're welcome let's see trying to get back to the book here okay do you want to keep reading here it says my grandmother reading about your grandmother what Okay, your grandmother used to tell me to get ready for future life. She thought nothing was unluckier than not being ready. She always said that when times were bad, you needed to go, you needed to do good, bad luck things. Interesting. Those were activities that used up a lot of key or involved change, which is hard on the body and include getting married, having a baby, going back to school, traveling a lot, changing to a new job or moving. In the Western world, these things are considered quite exciting. But in the Chinese, all of these activities were not considered very lucky because they took such a toll on the body. That makes sense. But they were the best kinds of bad luck because they involved some enjoyment. Okay, so if you have enjoyable bad luck, it's better. And obviously, the Chinese have unusual ideas about what luck is. Yeah. Then when the real good luck finally came, you would have your education out of the way. Your wanderlust would be spent 
or the total responsibility of a very small child would diminish some when your child started school. You'd be free and somewhat settled and ready to do what you were supposed to do. Any features that is mishappened, irregular, out of proportion, or distorted can signify potentially difficult time coming. Let's take the forehead in the 20s as an example. Many stressors occur in the 20s under the guise of having fun. True. Much overuse of the jing occurs too, yeah. Many years ago, I gave a talk to a group of doctors on April Fool's Day, which I thought was funny. That is. They, were more than a little re they were more than a little resistant to the concept of the facial map and skeptical of its validity until I pointed out that nearly everyone in the room had the same kind of deep lines and hollowed on the forehead from the mid to the late 20s. I pointed out the five exceptions and then asked the group what they could have in common at that period of their lives. As they looked around the room and they realized that they had done, that all done very similar markings, a few of them started to laugh when them finally yelled out, medical school. And that's what I say. It's like, it was confirmed that everyone with those markings on their forehead had gone to medical school at the same age. Five others had gone earlier or later and had markings in an entirely different place. After that, they thought the facial map was fascinating and started to accept the concept more readily. The markings on all the doctor's faces indicated that the stress pressure and lack of sleep during the medical school had taken quite a toll on their gene. Their way of thinking about the world was forever altered. They became different people and their lives were changed because of their experiences and their face showed it. Of particular importance on the facial map is the critical transitions that occur between the features. Changing from a momentous feature to a, or a mountainous feature to a river feature or a vice versa. Since every feature represents about 10 years of time, it is the decade of birthdays that are considered significant. Everyone marks the milestone that it decade birth represents. I know many women and men who suffered during 30s or 40s agonizing over turning 50 and went into a depression about turning 60 because they felt so old. In traditional Chinese face reading, the time immediately preceding and following the decade birth was a time to reflect, reevaluate, and make shifts in the life purpose of, or golden path. Many of these periods have been given names in Western psychology, such as the midlife crisis or the empty nest syndrome, or there's some dispute about whether these crises or symptoms are real or imagined, but the critical transitions are quite real and involve the emotional implications, implications of aging. These fascinating periods are when suppressed material must surface to be worked on, People often feel as though they've been hit over the head by issues they thought they had already worked through, and yet they reappear and have obviously not been completely resolved. All those old issues that they were sure they were done with rear their ugly heads and make them pay attention to the past yet again. <laughs> those are the times when almost everyone questions who they are why they are here, and if they are happy. I call it the time when the armor cracks and light gets in, or even better, the time when you get to fertilize the seeds for your future with the fertilizer from the past. You have been out in the world a while and the clock has begun ticking in your life. You are still searching for a meeting, the challenges that come up when you rethink the priorities and everything about your life can be up to, for review. The good news is that the more work you do on yourself during these critical transitions, the healthier you will be later. By going through these transitions fully, you get a new lease on life, letting go of old patterns, releases energy that was bound up and stuck in the past. I call this new energy recons reconstituted. Yeah, how come I'm looking at that and getting tongue tongue? reconstituted gene, the wisdom or cosmic water that you gain from understanding your experiences gives you new energy to face the future. Your gene energy will never be what it was, 
but you do get some of that locked up energy back. Well, that's nice that's cool. to know. Yeah. However, having personally gone through a hard critical transition a few years ago, I have to say it's not fun. I call it walking the shadow side of the moon. Do it anyway, don't avoid it, and do it thoroughly. It pays off, I promise. Each critical transition brings valuable lessons, and the relief you get when it's over is so enjoyable. You often don't even notice that it's over until you wake up one day and realize that you are not suffering anymore. In fact, it may have been weeks or even months since you felt blue, tired, or disappointed. Then you realize that you've passed through. It's wonderful that, or when you're done, at least for this round, <laughs> wow. the experience will end up giving you transformation lines, which should be viewed as badges of honor. <laughs> Great. Yeah. I don't want those transformation lines. I want that extra transformational jing that she's talking about without the lines. <laughs> so which we'll learn about later in this chapter. The first major critical transaction is in the late teens and early 20s. And this is the area known as the palace of inheritance as discussed in chapter one. This is the very top of the forehead in an area that's usually somewhat rounded when there is a lot of inherited talents and abilities. The problem with this transition is that this is the time in life when you think you know everything. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's my 17-year-old, there you go. Even before that, the pro um, you are going to do it so much better than your parents and after you go through it, you finally realize your parents were not so dumb after all. I remember, I remember the day that I discovered that. I've met many 20-somethings <laughs> who have said, it's amazing how much my parents really know with astonishment in their voice. Wow. You know, I tried to get my kid to think, when your mother screws up, who does she call her mother? Why do you think she calls her mother? I don't know, because she's been through it before. You don't call people, you know, your mother doesn't call you and say, hey, what about this? You know, and what do you do? You go ask your stupid friends and they, they're as dumb as you are. Go ask somebody that's older and experienced and they're, yeah. they're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So very few people deal with their issues well here. They're usually too busy being out in the world starting a life of their own. They're in school, starting work, or starting families early. In ancient face reading, this was also considered a karmic time. Whenever karma um, you were carrying from the genetic memory from your parents and other family members, or even possibly wives, show up here from and out of the blue. This area is called inheritance, as was discussed in chapter one, and carries signs of the lessons that you have brought with you. So don't you think it would have been nice so, to have known that like if when you're like 19, 20, so that when you go into your 20s, you know that this time, the 20s are a time of, you know, it, that it's a con karmic time? Yeah, but are we still smart enough to understand that? No. But depending, I think, on how receptive you are to uh, embracing the unseen world and spiritual concepts and so forth, at least it's on your radar and now you can at least open yourself and ask more effective questions because in recognition that you ultimately, none of us, even, I don't care what age you're at, you always, there's more of what you don't know than what you do know. So, you know, whatever age you're at, like I remember when I had the realization, um, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago where I was like in my 30s and I was thinking, oh my gosh, um, you know, people who are like 60, 70, 80 years old, when they hit 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, that's the first time they've been that age. So like somebody who's 85, they've never been 85 before. So do they know how to be 85? No. Right. How do they do it? They do it one day at a time. So there are things that are new to them as an 85-year-old that wasn't, you know, 
wouldn't have happened to them when they were in their 50s or their 30s or their 15 year, you know, teenage years. But as an 85 year old, now they're experiencing whatever for the first time. And so they're learning how to be an 85 year old from that perspective. So they know as little as I do about being 85 because they're just in the midst of figuring that out. And then before you know it, 85 will be behind them. And now they'll be 86 for the first time. And so it's like, to have harsh judgment on someone, you know, that's older than us, you know, saying, oh, they should know better because they're wiser and blah, blah, blah. It's like, they haven't experienced everything yet. You know, when they get to the end of the line and they get to go in the ground, then they can go, okay, these were everything, all the things that I learned and all the things that I experienced, but they're still in queue. They're still learning things. That's why they're still here. Yeah, and as the twenty-something generation goes, oh, those are—they're old and stupid. They don't know anything. But I laugh. I think some do and some don't. I think I think because I've met young people who are um, who are more wise than some people who, who I know who are in their forties and fifties. I'm going, I'm like, damn, you know, you're more emotionally uh, grounded and you have a higher emotional uh, IQ and I, regular IQ than people who I know they're in their 40s and 50s. And it's like chimney crickets. It's like, that's like refreshing. And then there is a lot of others who, who don't, but I think that there's, um, um, you know, it's just like anything else. There are some, some people are more mature in some areas of life as opposed to others. And it's not always tied to age because sometimes you meet a younger kid or young person and they're you can see that they're very much an old soul they're not like all the other kids their same age they seem to be walking with um, either a greater awareness or they seem to be wiser maybe I don't know if cautious would be a good word but they just seem to have a greater awareness and they're not as uh, they're not as uh, maybe careless or ignorant than their peers. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we've all met them. It's like, oh, this is refreshing. Yeah, yeah. And then you're like, oh, yeah, it is refreshing. Just the same when you meet like an older person, like I've had, uh, you know, some of my greatest mentors were, you know, 20, 30 years older than me. I have one of my mentors just passed away, not this last Christmas, but the Christmas before. And um, Bill was 91 when he passed away, but I kid you not, you could put Bill up against uh, someone who was 40 years old and he could outrun them probably. He, you know, he was jumping out of plane still. He was, he could still rock it and dance with his wife. His wife, Rena happened to be 20 years younger than him. And I knew guys that were in their thirties and forties that couldn't dance all night long like him and Rena. And here he was, well, when he passed, he was 91, but he was still dancing to that level, I'd say, till he was maybe 88, 89. And then he slowed down the last year. But it's like, my goodness, his, his mind was not his chronological age. He was super wise, super, he was a sage. But his spirit, he was as ebullient as, uh, and physically fit as like a, a very fit, 35 year old man who was like at his prime and wow. and I knew guys that were 45 who are already old even though they're only 45 which I think 45 is still a fairly young man or a woman and so it's like to me that's admirable because he had this just incredible life spirit and energy and joy for living and there's nothing that was going to stop him I mean, ultimately what ended up stopping him was he finally passed away at 91, basically of old age. So I think that's as refreshing as an old soul who is, you know, maybe 20 or 25 or even 17 or 31 who is more um, aware and more conscious and more, um, it's almost like they have less ego than their counterparts. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
and also my 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 great grandfather was one of those that just going 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 and they used to say god it's going to take a train to kill him and he was in his 80s and he was working in the lumber yard and he was out working the kids that were 20 years old and finally what happened his car stalled on a railroad track train came along hit him and killed him so it took a train to kill him oh <laughs> my gosh it's almost like they spoke a prophetic word on him oh i said see that tells you you can't say shit like that <laughs> but there's it's one of those where yeah you read about him and wow. um, one of his grandkids put together a book I said, this is my stories about him. If you've got different stories, you tell me. And so it's interesting talking to different people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but see, that the yeah. cool thing is, so that was your grandfather? My great-grandfather. Your great-granddad. That's who it that's was. A, that's part of the fiber of who you are. You have that same chutzpah in your in your bloodline so that's like there's clues about who we are as people i think when we look back to not just our parents and our grandparents but you also look to your grandparents and when you look to your parents siblings and your grandparents siblings and your great grandparents siblings mm -hmm. there's clues sometimes there are people in your ancestry where you're like oh my gosh i'm exactly i look physically exactly like you know my great grandmother's you know middle sister and it's like oh come to find out we yeah. have you know there's similar interests and you're like whoa it's kind of like history repeating itself and i don't know so much that it's history repeating itself but there you know there are clues there and it kind of shows you where you come from in a good way yeah yeah, interesting guy as far as some of the stories that I was reading in this book about him. He used to be a sheriff, and he was out one time doing something, and some Indians came up on him, a couple of Indians, and he was preparing dinner. And he said, you're welcome to join my campfire and have my dinner, and I'll share my dinner with you. But if you're here to steal my horses, I'm going to have to kill you. And so wow. they weren't sure. And he made, he made chili. And the Indians were used to bland, bland food. And he was used to Mexican food. So he's eating this chili like no big deal. Tears are running down their face. Oh and it was kind of like they decided, this guy is tough enough to eat this stuff. We don't want to mess with him. Oh my gosh! And Who is this guy? My great grandfather. Oh. Yeah, there's lots of stories like that. Indians came up and they said, "We want your horses. Give us your horses." And he said, "No, I'm not giving you your horses. If you need my horses, I'll let you borrow my horses. But I expect you to give them back when they're when you're done with them." And he spoke Navajo, Spanish, oh. and English. And he, he so a few home? weeks later, he went back because he, he grew up in the West. He was a sheriff in Blanding, Utah. Oh, and my wow. grandmother told me that one time he'd keep the prisoners in the basement of the house and he would bring them up for supper. And after supper, he broke out a guitar and would be playing the guitar and singing. And this one guy had his sombrero pulled way down and didn't say anything. And all of a sudden he started playing this song and this guy stood up, threw the sombrero down, started dancing all around it and singing. And it was Pancho Villa. So, yeah, interesting character. Wow. That is very cool. Sounds yeah. like he was very personable though. Yeah. He was, and he was, he was fair as far as he didn't go after his, like if you did something wrong he went after you but if he found out that it wasn't right you know and you didn't treat anybody he treated everybody basically equally you broke the law you broke the law you got to pay a price 
and he was fair. And that was like what the Indians are like, no, not only have my horses, but if you need them, I'll let you borrow them. I just expect them back when you're done because I need them too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, he sounds like so he was fair. He sounds had, like he was very yeah, charismatic. Yeah, because he was fair. Yeah, because I would guess that too. But because it was fair, he had the respect of the Indians. And he could speak Navajo, so it made it easier. Yeah, so obviously so, some, of the peop some of the Navajo Indians must have liked him enough to, to, you know, to interpret for him so that he could learn the language. And they obviously befriended him. He must have had a lot of charisma. Because I don't think in those days they were very open to non-Navajos learning their language. You know what I mean? Yeah, I've thought about that. Think about it. But, you know, yeah. that, that, has to, that must have happened at least over 100 years ago. And so I'm sure that they're, you know, for him to have befriended them to the point where they're willing to share their language and, you know, have him understand them in their language took a lot of communication. So he must have been very charismatic for them to embrace him, you know, his energy, because they read energy, you know, really well. So he must have had a, quite a bit of charisma, which is probably, you know, why he d ended up doing so well. That's pretty amazing. That's remarkable. Yeah. Wow. You want to read the, the next section or do you want me to read it? Don't matter me. Okay. Um... I'm trying to remember where we're at. Unfortunately, most people don't work in their issues. Or did we read that whole thing? We Because uh, they're too busy being surprised and shocked about life. Yeah, we I think it was, the second, the isn't second it that last paragraph? Um, we talked about, um, yeah, we're at the third paragraph. Things can happen at this time that make no sense. <laughs> That's so true. Yeah. If it is karmic, you can tell because it feels as if you've been sideswiped. Karma hits you when you least expect it, and you can't figure out why whatever just happened has happened. Totally unprepared, you end up learning invaluable lessons about yourself and gaining big clues that help you get on your golden path. Life or lines that mark here across the top of the forehead mark deeply. Um, and the suffering that occurs with the karmic lessons is usually directly applied to future work and makes sense only when you find your true calling. Then you can have that sudden realization that the meaning of your life experiences that finally makes sense. Unfortunately, most people do not work on their issues that much during their 20s. They're too busy being surprised and shocked about life and figuring that everything is going on. And going on is just a fluke or a coincidence the forehead marks here because of what i call the oh my goodness syndrome everything that shocks or surprises when the brows to lift and help reinforce the lines of the lesson for example people think they know what marriage is like but until they do it themselves they don't really know very much about it they may think they know what's working is like after coming out of school surprise Usually takes hindsight to understand what is real, what it's really like to live in this world. Or they may think they know how to be a parent until confronted with a crying baby that won't stop. Late in the early 20s, may be remembered as fun, or life, life in the early 20s may be remembered as fun, but it was actually hard work, even if you were partying all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> um, the woman has had stressful experiences in her 20s, some of the lines across the entire forehead, showing she learned some important lessons. Some are incomplete, showing that she still has things to learn about her patterns. The next critical transition occurs at the end of the 20s and in the 30s. This shows up at the bottom of the forehead and often shows heavy indentations when it is a difficult passage. This is often considered a spiritual crisis because this is the age when many of the great religious teachers found their calling and mission. In astrology, it's called Saturn return, which implies that the heavy energy of that planet creates hardship and suffering 
at that transit in life because most people have now spent about 10 years out of the world out in the world they've begun to realize the world does not work the way they thought <laughs> yeah all <Not> right <laughs> many men become very concerned because they yeah they've not become the instant success that they were sure they would be by 30 although this is changing in the world of technology and many women are starting to get very concerned about aging their biological clocks start ticking. This is usually a time to reevaluate careers and to take relationships more seriously. Many people get married during this time and start their families, or they finally move out of their parents' home. This is often the end of a very delayed adolescence and it becomes time to act as an adult. I call this time cutting the apron strings for good. The next critical transition, and one of the most important ones, occurs during the lay. You got to flip the page. There we go. Yeah. 30s and early 40s. This shows up around the eyes and at the top of the nose. People often agonize over the lines that occur here and do not attribute them at all to the issues they're working on. They're most likely seen as signs of aging that increase their unhappiness. Hmm. But these lines can last and when the process is done, as will be discussed later in this chapter, the period is often called the beginning of what has been called a midlife crisis, a time when a general dissatisfaction and malaise occurs Aging becomes a big factor for both men and women as the skin begins to line more and the body begins to sag more. <laughs> Gray well, hairs and extra weight start appearing. <laughs> yeah. And the critical age of 40 is looming fast or has just passed. Weren't you supposed to be something or be somebody important by the time you turned 40? This period involves a lot of issues with self-esteem. Many people have children who are growing fast and this makes them feel old. Or they're panicking because they don't have any children yet and it makes them feel, they're, feel like their absolute last chance. I know so many women who get serious baby hungry because biology still controls the reproductive organs. This is a time of many divorces as people try to find themselves often in the arms of someone else who isn't all that different from the one they left. Many people realize that their job is just not a career. It is unfulfilling and unrewarding and they struggle to find a new path. Many of my clients are this age and what has been scaring me the most is how many of them are getting diagnosed with serious diseases, which are their wake up calls to live an authentic life. They may have overused their gene or lost access to it because it is blocked by past traumas or they have lived so hard to find it as they approach 40 that they are tired. Their bodies end up betraying their still youthful spirit. They are getting sick with the illness that used to be reserved for people many years older. I'm shocked at the number of people with serious diseases that are showing up in the late 30s and early 40s. I'm also painfully aware that many of them are also dying far too young because of them. If you get a wake up call at this time or any other time, answer it. That's good. That's good. Find a way to regain access to your inherited gene abilities and talents and let your spirit emerge so that you can find the energy to get on your golden path and then you will get healthier. The good news is that I also have numerous clients who have beaten cancer. Mm. held back the effects of Parkinson's and have overcome many diseases to lead productive and rewarding lives for many more years than was expected. One of the most important markings in this area is the horizontal lines that appeared across the bridge of the nose between the eyes discussed in chapter one. And that's one of the, li the lines that I've been wondering about. It says this line shows the need for self-nurturing after the age of 41. Remember how easy it was to stay up all night to cram for finals when you were 20? Oh, yeah. After 40, it can take three days to recover from staying up all night just for one night. That depends on the, the recovery rate for any kind of 
Yeah, but you, they're talking probably average person here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely harder for me. It takes me three days to recover. Um, that makes sense. Um, the recovery rate of any kind of abuse to the body is slower after 40, and the body transfers energy from a savings account of Jing to a checking account of Qi. Um, what you put in it is what you get out. The deeper the line, the more Jing has been overused and the more self-care is required, especially involving the transformation of food or disease or disorders of overuse start appearing. The immune system begins to get seriously compromised. And one of the best ways to help it is to eat better and get more nutrients into the body. This line at 40 across the bridge of the nose can also appear because of a major life shift that many people experience at this age. This is the radical shift such as moving across the, the world, getting a divorce after being married for a long time, having a baby, or any number of other life-changing events. The way of life can never be the same because this line crosses the central face facial meridian at a very important spot. So that's that's something I've been to seeing that note, line remember, on a lot of people. So. Yeah, I see it on a lot of people too. If you remember from our class, RJ, RJ almost practically had mm -hmm. a hole at the bridge of his nose. It was super marked on his face. So obviously, oh yeah, yeah, he has it really, really pronounced. Um, Pam and, has it too. Who? Pam. Pam has it on her. She's face. got that. that yeah, that line across the nose. I'll have to look at a picture of her. I don't remember her having it so marked. I just remember RJ being very pronounced across. So that's, you know, at the age of 40, some sort of major life shift it's talking about. Um, like she's saying, it could be anywhere from divorce to getting married to the opposite, you know, having a baby, moving across. You know, it's a major life change at that point. Um, and apparently, mm -hmm. because of the location of where it is at the bridge of your nose, it directly affects usually your spleen and or your pancreas, but usually your spleen is the first organ that it can't affect. Um, and I thought, wow, that's, uh, you know, it's something to remember because you see it on so many people. I seem to see it more on men than I do on women. Hmm. Um, Interesting. And I haven't paid attention. I've just seen it and was trying to figure out what, what it, it is. is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other thing that yeah, we're talking about, that lines, line. you know, the lines on the forehead on, on, on a lot of men, and in some women, you, it seems like the lines, the lifelines along the forehead are more pr pronounced on men than, it, than they are on women. Also depends the age of the woman, I think, as well. But, um, like, I know, I know I have them. Um, you can't on camera, you can't really see them, but if I frown up, you can see, like- Yeah, but see, look at your hair. I'm sorry? Yeah, you don't have real heavy lines. No, you don't have real heavy lines. But but if you were to see me in person- Like you when you look, just look lines, at the video, like I've got them. Yeah, you can't- They're light. You're very yeah. light. But like, you know, it doesn't look like I have any at all. If you were to see me in person, the where I might put my um, you know make my muscles go up those that appear I've seen you in person yeah well, yeah you I'm sorry so I was gonna say yeah. that in person if you were to see me in person like but, I could see here they're actually double lines but they're super thin um, and so they're not red they're not deep grooves but there there are lines but they're like double lines like I have double here double here, double here. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I don't have any, they're so faint that they're not really, not really there because then they fade as they go down. Um, so I think it's kind of, you know, different things to note. I think also the type of skin that you have too. I think some people tend to, um, you know, there's depending on if it's drier or if it's more oily, I think you tend to mark more or mark less as well. Um, Anyhow, um, just something to note. Yep. Okay, share here. 
So, okay, so now, so this line at 40 across the bridge, when, you wanna go ahead? Oh, we already- Line at 40 across the bridge note can also appear because of major life shift that many people experience at this age. This is a radical shift, such as moving across the world, getting divorced. Yeah, we did this one. Yeah, the next After being married for a long time, having a baby. So the next critical transition occurs during the late 40s and the early 50s. The end of the nose and the um, filtrum area, this is, um, if there is a line at the end of your nose or you have a pinched nose tip, your critical transition will start in your late 40s. If your filtrum is marked, lined, or sunken, the critical transition will be more apparent in the early 50s. The most important marking occurs at age 51. Um, Chinese age 50 and Western age um, will also be discussed in chapter one. This area is on the groove or the filtrum between the nose and the lip. The groove is symbolic of these reproductive organs. Horizontal markings across the filtrum show the transition between fertility and creativity. When a line is present, fertility has been compromised or is no longer possible. Hmm. Up until the age of 50, reproductive reproduction drives the sex urge for most people. After 50, most women experience menopause, and for women, the testosterone levels start. Um, let me see, the sex drive diminishes, and this vital sexual force that was used for making babies can now be utilized for creativity and for spirituality. And this is why this area is called the Palace of Immortality, as discussed in Chapter 1. To the ancient Chinese, having babies was a work of art, a living miracle. And creating works of art is just like pregnancy in that it involves conception, gestation and birth, and the miracles of creation. I will never forget looking down at my newborn son and being in awe as the miracle that I had been a part of. He was so beautiful. I had to make him. I was so proud of the baby. Then only a few years later, my son pens the wall. He looked at it like this. It is so beautiful. It sounded just like what I said when he was born. That made me aware of the connection between fertility and creativity. It certainly takes much creative energy to raise children. The period that follows is usually around early 50s and is called the empty nest syndrome. Right, next page. It's stalled. I already flipped the page. It's not flipping the page. It's, yeah, there I flipped we. It. Yeah, I flipped it on my end, but it hasn't. Well, it's trying. Up. It's trying. Yeah, it hasn't showed up on on mine. There it comes. Oh. Well, it kicked in. There's a little lag then. Yeah, it just kicked in now and finally. And it was like it went <clears throat> uh, uh, to even get that way. You know. So many grieve heavily over the loss of their children as they mature into adults and move away from home and some rejoice. But this is the time of life when you're finally freed from your biological drives and have the chance to use your creativity for your own satisfaction. Raising good people is a good thing, but it is also so important to take care of yourself. I would much rather call this period feathering your own nest. Unfortunately, many people have also revisited their issues in this critical transition of their early 50s because of the vulnerability they feel about aging. To live longer, the body wants to start purging the things that are suppressing optimal health. Mm. And at the old, and all the old issues return. This time, however, they come from with many physical ramifications. Almost everybody at this age gets hit by health concerns that were never problems before. True. 
I know many men facing what I call the aging jock syndrome who suffer from all the old sports injuries they had in the past. Knees, shoulders, elbows give out and require surgery. Arthritis flares and joints and backs ache. Men suffer the loss of their once strong and useful bodies. Men who act out instead of looking in and often try to reclaim their youth by becoming boats or cars. At work, they fear layoffs and being fired as never before. They're too close to retirement to take any risks with their jobs. And those who lose their jobs suffer much harm to their egos. At this time in life, the male ego gets hit hard. And the fear of aging makes men run back to whatever made them happy before, or they try to relive a life they never had. <coughs> hmm. Women also grieve the loss of their useful beauty and former spelt shape as the dr dreaded middle age spread starts occurring. Hormone functions drop drastically with all its repercussions for aging skin and bodies, and yet gives reprieve to many of the difficult symptoms that plagued their pre-menopause years. Women with a little more women are a little more, more likely to look inward, but the fear of being replaced by the younger woman is great. They try the to use many external remedies to combat signs of aging, like wrinkles, including plastic surgery. They lose their primary roles in life and struggle to find their meaning after children. If they can make the transformation from fertility to creativity, they get a new lease on life. Many women find great joy in their freedom, but regret, disappointment, and lost opportunities can become a strong focus and can lead to bitterness as life turns out not to be the fairy tale they once dreamed of. They followed all the rules. Why aren't they happy? The antidote is to make your own rules. Hmm. Yeah. This is not an easy, yeah. critical transition for men or women. And one of the most likely hits to occur is the death of parents or peers. This brings up tremendous fear of one's own, or one's own mortality. I cannot stress enough the importance of living for oneself during these major critical transitions of the early 50s. And the kind of aging that occurs is not inevitable. In fact, the ancient Taos considered the time after menopause or andropause to be one of the most powerful times in life when people had tamed the dragon, which was a metaphor for ceasing menstruation or gaining mastery over the body's biological drives. The chance for enlightenment was significantly enhanced. This is because you're free from your worldly obligations and are able to pursue your soul's work in accordance with your true nature. Another important thing to note is the number of start reversing after, the numbers start reversing after age 50 for both men and women, which indicates the transformation of yin and yang. Women need to become more powerful and exert their yang energy as their female hormones subside and men need to find and uncover their yin self as their male hormones diminish. This reversal is a necessary part of Taoist alchemy and creates a balanced life. The critical transition at 61, Chinese age, Western age 60, is much easier for most people. Markings across the upper chin signify a change of life that occurs in the early 60s. This often correlates with retirement as discussed in chapter one, it, it signifies the need to stop doing work that causes overexertion. And if a person has a small chin, retirement may be a very good thing as the will is not strong enough to keep pushing so hard. The relief that these people feel in leaving the workforce can be energizing. And then finally find time for their hobbies and pleasures. Unfortunately, retirement is also a risk. Far too many people die within several years of retirement because the change in key is too great. And many people feel unproductive and become depressed if they don't have enough to keep them occupied. They can become lost souls if they no longer have a reason to get up in the morning. The key is not to stop doing it in retirement, but instead to transition to an equally busy life doing other, more enjoyable things. Keep doing something relevant and have fun doing it. This period also starts easy or easing people into acceptance of becoming older and the acceptance of aging is usually more graceful here than the angst so apparent in the 50s. Grandchildren are often a great delight 
and people have a chance to make up for their mistakes of parenting with their children's children. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Potential poor health is shown in the 60s by a variety of markings across the chin, and many chronic conditions become manifest. Most common are digestive disorders and structural problems with the body, such as back pain, brittle bones that break easy, and joint problems, as well as problems with memory and forgetfulness. Fear is the primary emotion to be dealt with because courage wanes as physical strength lessens and marks the chin. See the emotional map. The right use. Okay, I just flipped the page. Yep, and I'm waiting for it to load. Oh, okay. There we go. The right use of it will, um, means you need to stop wasting willpower by trying to make things happen that aren't supposed to. By their 60s, people are old enough to have gained a lot of wisdom from experience. And one of the most powerful things to do is watch their children and grandchildren make similar mistakes and suffer through their issues without listening to the advice of their experienced elders yet they're still young enough to play. And that is one of the most important prescriptions for this critical transition. With, <coughs> with turning 70, Western age, 71, Chinese age, which shows at the bottom of the chin, an acceptance of aging occurs. As my mother once said, I just got tired of fighting the aging process. So I said to myself, I may be old, but I'm still good. This is when the innate spirit needs to be the dominant energy and it needs to take over from the physical jing as the energy to live on. The rest of the 70s are shown across both sides of the jaw. Any markings here show potential problems at this time. Unfortunately, many people at this age need to be cared for and are cared for by their children or are in adult communities and nursing homes. There is no reason for them not to be vital, but in the Western world, the belief in wisdom of a 70-year-old to society is simply not value enough. To maintain health and to encourage longevity, simple pleasures need to be enjoyed, especially as disease often starts taking a toll on the body. The easiest way to get through this transition is to come to an understanding that the past of the past and let go of all the negative emotions. This revitalizes the key rekindles ties with estranged loved ones is also very helpful. Many of the controls of behavior have been let go and the true personalities of people become manifest. Crankiness and irritability are often present. This can often be caused by over-medication, no eyebrows, interesting. And that can decrease energy levels and harm the liver key quite dra dramatically can also be a result of the, of the pain from chronic conditions and illness, but this is a sign that the spirit is not actively engaged in life, so that joy in the present moment can be experienced. Humor is also a great panacea to pain that is emotional or physically based. It's important to stay absorbent to new things and to practice flexibility instead of rigidity. The good news is that the 70s can also be a time of reaping the benefits of a life well lived. There's much freedom in reaching this decade as eccentricity is uh, expected and being authentic contributes to longevity. So does keeping active, staying active, being involved, being in loving relationships of all kinds, enjoying simple pleasures, letting go of past hurts and looking forward to the future. These are all things that make people live longer and happier lives. One of my students told me that his mother said when she turned 70, it was like having climbed up and down mountains your whole life. And then one day you got to the top of the mountain and realized that there was this wonderful ridge that you could walk on without so much effort, work, and pain. And you could look down at all the people below still struggling and realize that you were beyond all that and life was good. I'm hoping to walk on the ridge too when I get to my 70s. At 81, the facial map changes again with the age positions going up one side of the face and then down the other. This means that life changes from the previous patterns that you have uh, more control over what comes next <coughs> and how long you have to live. The 80s are about enjoying life and reaping the rewards of the life you have lived. While many people suffer from physical ailments, they also get to realize 
how much they are loved. At this time period is also called the second childhood as people are free to be themselves and often take care of uh, instead of having to be so responsible for, oh, and often get taken care of instead of be, having to be so responsible. Living to this age is considered extremely lucky to the Chinese and every year after 80 is a gift. Another time of critical transition brings old here, hurts and fears up. They need to be dealt with as thoroughly as possible. Avoid su suppression of your issues for the future toll on your body is a high price to pay later. Face your fears and you will become stronger, healthier, and freer from the burdens of the past. If illness or disease strikes, do not take it as punishment, but rather as a lesson. There can be great gifts from the experience of illness. What is the emotional underlying of this disease? How can you track back to the origin of your pattern to help create this condition? Be gentle on yourself as you unravel the tangled issue of your past. Do not judge yourself. Free yourself. Most diseases are just wake-up calls. Answer with your spirit. I like that. Yeah. Okay. So you had any wake-up calls? Have I? Had, oh, I've had. <laughs> my whole <laughs> life is one daisy chain link of one wake-up call after another. Just when I thought, oh, I got this again. <laughs> Yeah, I've had I've had my fair share. Um, my first, I gotta say, my first wake up call was my first uh, when I was pregnant. The first one I lost. So I'm not gonna. That was obviously a form of a wake up call. But with my second pregnancy, which is my oldest son, I was put on bed rest with him. And so, okay, so I was on bed rest with him. So. I didn't think I was going to have to do the bed rest thing again. I, I understand that the universe was trying to tell me, slow down, stop hurrying all the time, stop running here, running there. Um, and sure enough, when I had my, when I got pregnant with my second child, with my daughter, I can't believe it. Now, a month before, at 18 weeks, I got put on bed rest again. And I thought, of course, that the doctor was overreacting. Wow. My nickname, my friends used to call me the Energizer Bunny because I kept going and going and going. And uh, I had a 300ZX, so I had a, a white sports car. So they'd say, you know, yeah, they would call me White Flash because it's like, I was like, go speed racer. And I thought I had slowed down because I had a kid now. And apparently not enough because I got put on bed rest again. So I thought, okay, I'm telling God, I'm like, okay, I get it, slow down. I have not one kid, now I got the second one on the way. So when I went to have my third one, I get put on bed rest again. I'm like, oh, come on, you know that I've slowed down. But I got put on bed rest again. Um, yeah, so I've had my fair share of <laughs> wake up calls. Um, <laughs> We don't have well, when you get 70, then you can finally realize what they really were. Oh, well, some of them are pretty obvious to me right now. It's like, oh my gosh, you know. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like there's no question about it. And, um, and it's like my most recent wake up call, which I had a premonition was coming because I had several dreams that were pretty clear. Um, and it was when my boyfriend and I broke up and that was very sudden and, um, very obviously uncomfortable and so forth. So, so that was another wake up call. And then I did a, I just completely did a 180 in terms of what I was doing, how I was, how I was living, where I was being just literally just plowed on a new adventure and my my life is completely unrecognizable from from then to now and it was just called to my attention i interviewed one of my friends who um uh we both the, the whole group of us we went to cancun and we were uh we went to dr joe's seven day advanced uh, event where he sets up a monastery in all different parts of the world this one happened to be in cancun and so faust was telling me telling me 
He goes, oh my gosh. He goes, I can't believe how much you've changed just in the time I've known you. He goes, what a radical transformation. I go, radical transformation? He's like, oh yeah. I know I've changed a little bit. I mean, I've been working on my, I feel like my whole life I've been doing this spiritual work. I'm like, when is this going to let up? I'm always like doing the deep dive and, and whatnot, but, but uh, here we are. How about you? As far as, yeah, lots of changes. And, and wake up calls. Yeah, as I'm trying to think, everything gone through from move across the country to Vegas to a divorce to you know, all sorts of fun stuff. Rediscovering who I am and what's going on. So, I think divorce for everybody. I think. I want to say everybody, not just most people, but I think that whether, I don't know what it would be like to have like a divorce from a short term tech marriage because my marriage was two decades. So, but I think anytime you go through a, a divorce, I think it's, yeah, no, that feeling. yeah it's got to give you a time of self-reflection. One day it's like, okay, nobody gets married anticipating or expecting to get divorced. I think most people plan. It's like, okay, if you're going to get married, um, if you're going to get married, it's going to be, you know, like, you know, for forever kind of a thing. And so, um, I mean, I think there are exceptions because my mother is one who her father always told her, it's like, you know what, you need to get a good education, become a teacher because they always need teachers all over the world. And if you get married and it doesn't work out, you don't have to stay married to the son of a bitch. You can forge your own independence. <laughs> I mean, he really believed that. Mm -hmm. And because my grandparents, in a time when, you know, divorce was not common, my grandmother divorced my grandfather because he was messing around on her. And she's like, oh, he goes, she's like, no, 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 no. And then my grandfather's like, what? You can't divorce me. And she's like, oh, yes, I can. And she did. Long story short, he ended up taking the kids away from her, which 80 years ago, that was unheard of. But he was a man with a lot of power. Yeah. And so he ended up taking the kids, he had affluence, so he had, you know, maids and he had a staff that could help him. And, you know, he put the kids in private boarding school and so forth, so he, he made it work. But um, 80 years ago, women did not divorce their husbands if their husbands cheated on them. It just wasn't done. Um, but, um, so that's why <laughs> my grandfather told my mom and her sister, you girls will become well-educated, you're gonna become teachers if, tomorrow you make a mistake and he's not treating you right then you don't have to stay married to that son of a bitch you can you can support yourself and you because they're going to need teachers all over the world so it doesn't matter where you live on the planet and so she figured okay i'll get married and if it doesn't work mm. out and my parents have been married for 55 56 57 years something like that they're, they're both 84 years old now and they're wow. still married so so she didn't have to ever exercise that clause but um but i think yeah for i think for men and for women i think women have the notion that uh divorce is harder for women uh than men because women tend to be more outspoken and more emotionally vocal about expressing the whole thing i think men have equally as difficult of a time and i think they're as traumatized if not the same maybe it's even worse because they don't find uh, you know I don't think they oftentimes have a place where they can talk about it with another guy that's gone through it or or have a, a, an outlet for that so I think it's uh, I think women always have other women even if you're a girl that doesn't have a bunch of girlfriends you always have at least one or two other girlfriends whereas guys that are going through it unless there's another guy that went through the divorce that will you know kind of say hey you know I know it's not easy if you need someone to talk to because that's what they you know needed themselves i think that that is uh it, i think it can be a more difficult challenging thing for them because they're still going through this stuff they're still you know having to deal with all that um energy all that emotion and figuring out it's like why did this not work why did this uh, if they're 
I can't imagine if they're thinking, oh, I failed. I don't think all marriages are a failure just because you got divorced. Like my divorce, we were married for over two decades. We had three incredible kids. We started with nothing. We, you know, we created something. We amassed, you know, a great thing during the time that we were together. And then it was great for a long time. And then it was not so great. And then it was really not good at all. And so it was time to, you know, I, I felt it was time to close the chapter and say, you know what, I just want to be free of this. I'm not happy with you. You're not happy with me. <laughs> I, I, we don't want to have anything to do with each other. Let's free ourselves to go our separate ways. Doesn't mean that the marriage was a failure. It just means that it's done. We did it till death do us part emotionally, spiritually, it's dead. So let's put that to rest and then free ourselves to be truly happy, whether we choose to continue solo or move on with someone else, move on. But I don't think everybody looks at it that way. I think a lot of people think if you're divorced, you failed, which I think is very self punitive unnecessarily. Yeah, well, that was the way I looked at it. It's like, okay, I failed. I think a lot of people do but that. And it's like, how many years? Then you it's married? like, okay, 27. Yeah, so yours was over two, de two and a half decades, almost three. So for, for almost three decades, let's say two decades, you had a successful marriage. You were married, you know, a lot of marriages don't even last 10 years, five years. Yours lasted almost three decades, two and a half decades. So it's like, okay. So there obviously was something that happened towards at whatever point in time towards the end so that it wasn't working for you and for her. And so if you just reframe it and realize it wasn't, it's not the whole thing was a failure because you have three gorgeous daughters. You guys started when you started, you finished when you finished. Now, you know. Okay, hang, hang on, all of a sudden it glitched. Oh, the, the camera glitched? Back that, back that up a paragraph. Yeah, I was gonna You're say. Saying, oh, yeah, well no, that wasn't the camera, it's the sound, it went. Oh. Yeah, it's the internet said, connection. You know, yeah, so look at it as far as you can. Yeah, so look at yeah. it as you know, you both started off, you know, it was just the two of you, then you created this family where you you created and gave birth to this family where you have three beautiful daughters. You went from, you know, being two separate individuals that came together, created a family, you have three beautiful daughters, you were married successfully for a quarter century, for two and a half decades, almost three decades. And then towards the end, as you guys continued to grow, obviously, as you know, like a lot of us, you know, you, so there's a certain amount of period of time that you grew together, but there came a point in time towards the end, which you obviously grew apart and it wasn't, it wasn't something where you could recover it. Maybe it was not part of your destiny, not part of your path. It was, you know, you needed that break where you finished the successful completion of a quarter century marriage and now the way it ended up ended where you're free she's free now you're separate back into the world again it's putting an amazing amount of pressure and amazing amount of um, change and transition uh, if, if that didn't happen there's no way you would be looking at your life the way you were forced to because of that experience, because you would have stayed content in a marriage. Maybe you weren't happy. Maybe you weren't fulfilled. Maybe she wasn't either. Maybe you weren't really feeling the love towards each other. Maybe you weren't really being the best example of two hearts that unconditionally love each other and showing your daughters really how to be in a loving union where you're treating each other with the honor and respect that you both deserve, that obviously wasn't there or you'd still be there. And so now you're being forced with divorce, which is cutting the two people apart and saying, okay, now no longer husband and wife. She's saying you're a husband and you're telling her she, she was a was wife because she's not your wife anymore. So I think X is kind of hard. So I call it husbands and was wives. And so now I like that. you were the husband you're the husband she was the wife she's the was wife and now it's like that's okay 
we're going to close the chapter of being husband and wife. We'll open the chapter, the new, the next chapter is of husband and was wife. And now you're both free to find that perfect place. Once you get into that whole place where you heal, you reveal what the lessons were that you were supposed to learn from this. Because if it hadn't been this degree of stress, because this is an incredible, uh -huh. when you go through divorce, you go through an incredible amount of stress. Stress, oh, yeah. change, unknowns, fear of loss, every, all of that stuff, your identity, who you are. Okay, well, I haven't been single in over a quarter century. It's like, what is that going to be like? So all that stuff gets drudged up. So now you have to kind of redefine who you are and what do you really want? What do you really not want? What do you open heartedly truly want? And you go, okay, I take responsibility for this is what I did. And this is what I didn't do because there are things that we do yeah. that cause that outcome. And there are things I know myself, there were things that I didn't do. And it's like, okay, I own up to that now. So I know better. And now I'm like going to work on myself so that moving forward, that is part of my past. It's not going to, just because it's part of my past, I don't have to bring it into my present and into my future. I'm going to leave that in the past. I'm not going to beat myself up over it. Forgave the other party. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, I forgave myself. Because you could forgive everybody and their brother. But if you don't forgive yourself, I'm sorry, you're screwed. Because the most important relationship that we can have is with ourselves. And to the degree that you can forgive yourself and you can give yourself grace, knowing, you know what? I didn't know better. If I knew better, I would have done better. But now you know better. Okay, good. So forgive yourself going, okay, I forgive myself. Now I know better. Eyes wide open now, paying more attention, you know, attention and intention to my heart, to my soul, to those inner promptings. And I'm going to do it better. And I'm, I am going to tear up any cord of energy between me and that person, any soul contract that was there, lesson learned. Let's tie any loose ends up because I don't want to repeat this with a different face in a different place. Screw that. <laughs> I learned the lesson the first time. I don't want to do over, do over, do over, different face, different place. No. Let's grow from this. And now with a clean slate, with wisdom that I didn't have before, had I had it to begin with, I wouldn't have gone through that. I wouldn't have had that ending. So shame on me if it happens again. So now I'm like, okay, let me clean up all this energetic, spiritual, psychological, emotional trauma and mess. And it's, it's, it's fertilizer, it's crap, but this crap is what I'm gonna put into my soil that is gonna bear incredible fruit because oftentimes, like I have a friend of mine, so funny, he's a cardiologist and um, he had a, he has, a patient of his who's in his late 80s and he said hey ben he goes so you know you and your wife have been married for <laughs> for over 40 years he goes what's what's your secret to success to a long and healthy marriage and he said second marriage that's the secret <laughs> -boo. he goes i made a few boo-boos in the first one and i decided i'm not gonna make those boo-boos anymore on the first that i made with the first one and second one's a charm. He goes, that's the secret to a long marriage is second marriage. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, how cute. Because he says, they're like two little lovebirds. Like both his patient, um, him and his wife come together. And so his patient, you know, tells him that the secret is the second marriage. And I'm like, oh, so that, because he's divorced. So he's like, okay, well that, you know, it is possible. You know, you may have not. Yeah, you know, you hear about about that. Like John Gray, uh, he wrote the you know, Mars are from, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. He's written like twenty eight books. He wrote a book that I'm reading right now called Beyond Mars and Venus, and he talks about how. See, and I always thought the the perfect book title should have been, "Women are from Mar no men are from Mars, women have no penis." <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Because Thank God we don't. Men and women need each other. I got, yeah. I got what you want, and you got 
what I want, you know? So absolutely. So men and women, yeah, there's like a perfect natural law and order where we need, e men and women need each other to actually be biologically balanced and hormonally balanced and all sorts of other things for us to be like fulfilled and happy, which is part of the design, you know, the divine design. But we need to, you know, we, we all, a man has a responsibility in a relationship and a woman has a responsibility, you know, in a relationship. We have to take responsibility for ourselves, our actions, the energy that we show up with and, and not take things so freaking personal. Because I think oftentimes our egos, uh, taking things too personally, it's like oftentimes people aren't really maliciously trying to do things to offend or hurt or whatnot. And, you know, communication, if we just got out of our heads and into our hearts more and just talked without blaming or without um, trying to change another and just saying, you know what, this is what I'm feeling. I'm not sure why this happened and this really offended me or hurt me or whatnot. And I'm not saying that you hurt me. I'm just saying that I felt hurt when I heard you say or do. And if we learn a better way of approaching and just people are so afraid to talk, especially when it comes to, you know, boy likes girl, girl likes boy and boy and girl are together. And then we go back to our little childhood wounds from when we were five or seven years old on the playground. And it's like, and then we bring that into the marriage and it's like, uh, you know, we need to, we need to have better tools. Again, once you know better, you can do better. And now you can move forward and find that person to, you know, to be, you know, whoever that forever person is going to be, you know, if you choose to get married or not, you know, that's yeah. everybody's individual choice, but, but that's really, it's like, stop, stop telling yourself because it's bullshit. It's a lie. I mean, if, and, and I, who cares? I know that when I, when I finally decided, it's like, okay, I'm going to file for divorce. Um, I wasn't asking my mother. I sure as hell was not asking my father. I wasn't asking my priest, mm -hmm. my rabbi, my pastor. I wasn't asking my friends. I was asking, you know what? This was between me, my spouse and my creator. And I go, and, and you know what? I'm a grown yeah. woman. When I go to meet my maker, when I'm getting rid of this meat suit, it's me and the creator and no mommy, no daddy, no teacher, no mentor, no, nobody outside of this is going to matter. I can't say, oh, so-and-so said, or I read in this book, that's not going to work. So you just have to go, okay. And it's like, I refuse to let it in. Anybody who says, oh, your marriage, I have yet to have one person that will have that will stand up to me and say, oh, you know, you have a failed marriage because you, you know, after two decades, you got divorced. It's like, that might be your truth, but I'm not letting that in. I had a successful marriage for a very long time. And there came a point in time where it was not working and it was no longer good for me. And it was not good for my kids. And I had to reconcile with that and decide, okay, it's time to get out time to and it saved, I, I know that it saved my husband's life because he had a, it, the heart condition that kept me from filing because I was afraid that it might push him over the edge. And I realized making fear-based decisions are, ne are never a good thing. Um, he, the 30 pounds that he needed to lose, after I filed for the divorce, he took up marathon running. He, he went from well, never would eat a healthy diet before. He always thought it was nonsense buying organic food and all this other stuff. He started eating organic food. He completely changed. Now, I didn't want to go back to him. I, you know, he didn't change. He, he had to change to cope with his stress. So, and I'm like, gl I'm glad that he took those necessary changes. It would have been nice if he took those necessary changes before, but I didn't, I wasn't requiring any changes from him and his eating and his um, physical appearance or any of those things. My issue was, you know, him and I talking and communicating and being a couple, being on the same page. And like, we were at least a roommate, you know, you talk to your roommate, you care if they go on a business trip, they come back, you want to know when they're leaving, when they're coming back. How was your business trip? My husband and I, it's like, didn't matter when they came, when he left, he didn't care what I was doing. There was no, 
like I said, there'd be more interest from a roommate. So it's like, why be married? There's no sense. There was, what's the point in being married? It's like, you know what? It's like, I'm better off being free. Then I can find somebody who actually wants to be in a relationship with me. I only want to be, it's a turnoff. Somebody who doesn't, who's not interested in me. I'm like, that's repulsive to me. It's like, no, I want to be with someone who wants to be with me. I want to love somebody. I want them to receive my love and to receive their love. And if that's not in the cards with this person, then next, <laughs> it's no, there's no sense. It was great for a long time and it was successful for the time that it was supposed to be. It was never a mistake. It was on purpose. Pressed us both to look at things that there's no way we would have looked at about ourselves had it not been for this divorce. So it's fine. I accept that and I move forward and it's like, it's a good thing. Things are so much better. So much better for all yes. of us. For all of us. That's not to say that it doesn't come without pain because I know he suffered pain. I suffered pain. I know my kids suffered pain. I wish my kids wouldn't have had to suffer any of that pain, but apparently it's part of their, it's part of their life path as well, you know? So that's all you can do and move forward and do better. So my friend, you did not fail at marriage. You succeeded what most, most, most Californians, most um, Americans, you know, it's, that's a big deal to be married for more than two decades, almost three decades. So, yeah. so you'll, you'll, you'll find the next, whoever your forever person will be. And you'll probably be married for another two and a half, three decades with whoever that person is. Cause you know, they, our lifespans are just getting longer and longer every year. So it's all good. Okay, it's 10 o'clock at night, so I think we should wrap it up for tonight. What do you say? Okay. Well, I have a, I have a request. You recorded this session. Yes, it's two hours Would you send it minutes. to me? Yeah, I will send it to you. I will upload it to YouTube. I'll put it on private. And, and, it, was, and it was the last, it was probably the last half hour when it was just us talking since we quit and everything you had to say. I went, I want to hear that again. It was some <laughs> real good stuff. Thank you. Okay. And there's and it's like I don't want to share that part with a couple other people. I, and I love the was wife. Yeah, the husband and the was wife so, because they. And yeah, it's if not, you it's if not, you would do that, I would definitely appreciate it. Yeah, and and it's it's you know I I don't like the sound of X. It sounds so harsh. So it's like husband because yeah. I was the husband and I'm the was wife. Well, I was the wife. I, I am no more. So. And that's fine. It's a good thing. It's like, okay, that's from chapter one. Now we're in chapter two. And that's a good thing. So, okay. Take what I will, you learn to move on to something better. Yeah, we're all learning. We're all learning. So it's all a good thing. So I will send you the recording. Okay? Thanks. All right. Have a good Appreciate one. Appreciate it. Ciao for now. You too. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.